Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 148 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by the show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, Pervez. Good to see you. Uh, and assalamu alaikum, listeners. Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Kareem. Hope everybody is enjoying Ramadan. Slightly shorter Ramadan days than uh, in, the, in the last few years. We, we, we survived those summer years. And I'm enjoying, Hazram, Hazram, I'm enjoying the shorter days for sure. Yeah, enjoying the shorter days. Yeah, me too. Um, and then also, I was just like reflecting on the fact that I think we're right at that. At least for me, it usually takes this amount of time, you know, the first ten days or so. But generally, after the first week, where you fully kind of acclimate to the new schedule, you've kind of weaned off caffeine, you know, to a lesser. <laughs> Speak or for yourself, today. brother. No, no, no. I <laughs> believe me. Um, I'm I'm one of those guys who I I do need a cup of coffee in the afternoon. I know you avoid coffee after like noon or something, uh -huh, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, I, I yeah, I can still tolerate it. You're exposing yeah, all I do my miss that. You're exposing all my old man habits: avoiding <laughs> coffee in afternoon, not drinking water in the evening. You know, all, yeah. all not staying up late. So those funny. are tough in Ramadan. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's that that's something else. But, but alhamdulillah, um, it's been yeah. a, it's been really yeah. good. Um, you know, I I think last few years coming out of COVID. Yeah. I feel like the community came out in, with a bang in terms of just making, um, I mean, the Bay Area I can speak to for sure. I'm sure it's like that in other places. It's like Ramadan is like jam-packed with activities for families, for kids. Agreed. Um, it's yeah. been great. It's been exciting. Yeah. If yeah. anything, I would like to do more, but I'm also just trying to, you got to balance that. You got to like balance. Getting your sleep own. And, and family commitments and whatnot. Family commitments, personal ibadah, whatnot, like stuff that we, uh, that we sort of got to with Imam Daher, which was the last episode that we had. So He, he gave some really good yeah, advice. I, I mean, agree. I think one of the things that I've put into practice this year is it doesn't have to be like all of Tharawi or nothing. Right. You like you can just go and pray Isha, mm -hmm. and then if you have to for whatever reason you can't make it for the full, uh, you can leave. But at least you got your Isha in, right? So exactly. Uh, props, just like her to Imam Daher for for sure uh, some of those tips that um, you know able to put into practice. Yeah, yeah. It was a short. I mean, like by the time we got to that part, you know, we had to kind of rush through it. But I think even in that short amount of time, he really left us with some gems. And I know we're going to be uncovering some precious gems today. So uh, we're really delighted. Uh, with our guest today. So, Umar, uh, why don't you do the yeah, honors? absolutely delighted to have Dr. Jihad Safir here. Uh, Dr. Safir earned a Master of Arts in Islamic and Leadership from Bayan at Claremont School of Theology in 2014 and then com completed his PhD at CST in Practical Theology. He is the resident imam and the founding executive director for Isla Academy, a K-8 Islamic private school based in Los Angeles. He is former chaplain of the California Institute for Women and the former Imam of Masjid al Taqwa in Al Tadina, California. In 2018, Imam Jihad was awarded with the prestigious KCET Local Heroes Award. More recently, South Coast Interfaith Council recognized Dr. Safir as its 2022 Faith Leader of the Year. Through Dr. Jihad Safir's leadership, Isla LA has spawned a new wave of civic engagement within the Muslim community. At Bayan, he teaches courses in Muslim adolescent identity formation, leadership development, and Islamic education. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely dive into uh, his origin story and also some of the really interesting work he's done in his master's and his PhD. Welcome, Dr. Safir. It's a pleasure being here, uh, especially during the uh, month of Ramadan. I think this is, this is gonna be a special uh, episode just by the, I think the energy Inshallah. that uh, yeah. is Thank in you. the room. So I, I look forward to no, our No, no, we really, we really are honored. Uh, I know that we've been trying to make this happen for quite some time. I know I, I, we even reached out to you when we drove down to Southern California. Our, we just weren't able to make it work. I think you were traveling at the time. Mm -hmm. So we are delighted to welcome you to the community here in the Bay Area. Uh, oh, just to situate us also, we, we're back at the same location where we recorded with uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Jamal one, mm -hmm. uh, which feels like uh, months ago, but it was not that long ago. But another uh, visitor from Southern California, your your neck of the woods. Yeah. Um, so we're we're delighted to really have you. Um, uh, and so we, we're going to definitely talk about the work that Isla is doing because I think that's one of the reasons why you are here. Yeah, so we're, we're here at MCC East Bay. Um, so if there are any ambient noises, that's what you're hearing. Uh, there's actually a few events going on here. I think there's uh, a lot of events going on. Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a good chance. So props to MCC for um, sure. Some community East Bay in, in yeah. Pleasanton for letting us use the facility. Yeah. And yeah, there are there's a bunch of activities. There's a minute camp. There's uh, a bunch of activities going on. So yeah. So again, delighted Imam, Imam Jihad. Um, so I guess you know. 
as we like to often do is kind of go back to the origin story, as mm -hmm. we like to say. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of tell us about your background, kind of situate us, you know, uh, maybe geographically. I know that's going to play a part if, when we get into Southern California. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely like to kind of start there. Well, uh, first of all, you know, shout out to uh, Pasadena, California. You know, raised in Pasadena, I went to elementary school, junior high school, also high school in uh, Pasadena, California. And um, the Muslim community has always been in South Los Angeles. So I was able to kind of, you know, build these two communities. You have uh, also Muslims in, in Pasadena, Altadena area. Um, so I had, you know, sort of a family, a Muslim family there. And then also the Muslim family, uh, many of my friends uh, in South Los Angeles um, attending uh, the Muslim community there. So, alhamdulillah, uh, born in 1981, uh, the Muslim community, my father and a few of the members, um, uh, the pioneering members of Masjid Ibadullah, uh, they started off at the Bilal Islamic Center. Now you have uh, Imam Abdul Karim Hassan, who is the uh, Imam, and he's he's you know one of our OGs. He's been the Imam uh, for years. Uh, my father was his assistant Imam. Uh, my mother also was a teacher at the Sister Claire Muhammad uh, School um, at that particular location. Which is now, I mean, there's continue to they're continuing to flourish. They just recently built a uh, a new uh, masjid from the ground up, um, and they also have a, a charter school. So um, imagine a thousand, over a thousand African Americans there praying sal Salatul Jumu'ah on a weekly basis. It was a very beautiful community. Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned your parents. It's it's um, it sounds like you were born Muslim. Um, you can you can uh, talk about that, but I really want to even go back to your parents. So it sounds yeah. like your parents are were Muslim as well, and I'd love to you to rewind us all the way back to their story, uh, if if you know even if just briefly. Hmm. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So I, my my father, uh, he was uh, he's from East Chicago, Indiana. Um, you know, you have a, a small town, new addition in uh, Indiana. and um, The name of the town is a new addition? Yeah, new addition. <laughs> no idea. Okay, yeah, is, that, yeah. is that like, is that Gary? Is that generally the not area? Not too far from Gary. Not too, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, not too far from Gary. Gotcha. Um, but it's in that same area around new Hammond, addition. Indiana. Uh -huh. and, you know. But right. they had a small, it's a, it's a very small town of African Americans uh, in new addition. Uh, my father came out here to uh, California and uh, he fell in love, he, you know, he never left. Um, I think, you know, partly the weather. Um, <laughs> Especially and, leaving Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, leaving Chicago. So, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, he, he became Muslim he, uh, through the way of uh, Nation of Islam. Um, in Chicago? No, here, oh, okay. when he came to California. Yeah. So he, as he says it, his friend uh, was constantly coming, telling them, telling him and his group of other friends, you know, about the Nation of Islam and the meetings that they were having, about the ministers and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, so he finally went and he never left. Um, I recently ran into an individual who he says that, you know, I was the sermon in which your father heard mm. and he ended up uh, converting. So uh, my father, uh, James okay. Kemp, became... Uh, James 75X, or maybe 70, 76X, you know, one of those, okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, which uh, means that there were perhaps 74 other Jameses <laughs> right. know, that came into the nation of Islam before, you know. That, that's so how it they, worked. Yeah, they're writing a letter to get in, to, and the letter has to be accepted, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, my father in the nation of Islam, he was a prominent member of the Nation of Islam, uh, he was on uh, the group, the Fish Crew. You know, um, the the nation had a contract with Peru in which they were able to distribute pounds, thousands of pounds of uh, whiting H&G. You know, so they would go to the dock, uh -huh. you know, over in uh, Long Beach, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, and, uh, you know, bring the fish and distributed all throughout the inner city. So my father was known, 
he was the top salesman of the uh, fish. They they caused uh, a change in the pricing even in the local supermarkets. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, wow. And we're, this is the sev- 60s? What yeah, so my, my yeah. father came in around 1970. So I have a letter, yeah. um, maybe a, around, I would say about uh, 15 years ago, we went to visit my uh, aunt, and uh, she lives now in Homewood, Chicago. And my aunt found a letter in which my father wrote to his mother and father in 1970. And this four-page letter, I, it's now framed. It's in my office. So, um, you know, so the, in this four-page letter, he's telling them, like, I didn't go crazy. I found purpose in life. Wow. Mm. You know, I, um, and he's telling them, I'm not on drugs. Yeah. I'm not drinking alcohol. I'm Muslim, mm-hmm. you know. And he's telling them that they need to go. He's telling his father and mother that they need to go and see the minister who was, you know, in that local area near Chicago. Yeah. We we would love a, a photo of that so we can post it when we <laughs> yeah. post the episode. Yeah, this, yeah, letter, yeah. this letter is incredible. I mean... It belongs I, in the archives, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. For sure. I, I, I recall, so I'm in the, in my aunt, you know, she has extra bedrooms, so I'm in one of the bedrooms and she reads the, the letter to my father and I'm in the bedroom, I couldn't help but cry. I didn't even want to come out because I'm I'm crying mm-hmm. so much because this is, um, you know, a part of my success. This is a part of me. Mm-hmm. You know, this has contributed much. His decision that he made has contributed uh, to where I'm at. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so, yeah. And your mother? Yeah, my mother. So my mother, uh, beautiful woman. As a matter of fact, her the name that she took on, uh, Muslima. So she came in night around 1975. She was attempting to get into the Nation of Islam, and she prepared her letter, and then the transition happened. I was just about to say, yeah, the transition happened. Right. So she was able, you know, of course she was able to. She was a part of the community coming in the Nation of Islam, but not. Uh, totally uh, getting fully in the door, and then the uh, the transition happened in which Imam Wardi Muhammad uh, transitioned the community from what they would call the first resurrection into this uh, you know second resurrection um, by you know introducing the community to the Quran and Sunnah and a more uh, mainstream approach to Islam. Probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, mass conversion in history. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In our history. Yeah. As, yeah. As, 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 yeah. And I'm I'm a, I'm a product of it. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm definitely so, a product of it. Right. Yeah. And so your so your father had already been in the nation then for so about five years. Your mom was just yeah. you know onboarding into the nation as yes. it were when the transition happens. Have they talked about or shared that experience? What that was like? you know, in terms of the schism that that caused within the community? Well, like, you know, because for me, you know, I almost, and and this is just, I don't know why this came to mind, but being from the subcontinent, right, you think of the partition, like it's this, like where families were, I mean, literally families were torn apart in terms of those who decided to stay or decided to migrate. So I would imagine you have that. I mean, it's not cookie cutter, clear cut, you know, everybody goes, you know, who thought one way and everybody stayed back who went another way. It's a lot messier than that because these are human experiences we're talking about. So yeah. I don't know if you have any insight into what that was like. Yeah, from talking to my uh, my father especially, my father, he was one of those, he, you know, he went along with the, the change. He was able yeah. to, he had trust in the leadership and he was able to smoothly smoothly transition in regards to that to that change others it wasn't as smooth you know they had a very difficult time um you know breaking down some of their their foundational you know beliefs so my father he how he um frames it is that we were on the freeway going in the wrong direction over a hundred miles an hour and someone had to stop that vehicle and turn it towards the right, you know, direction. Yeah. 
Mm. You know, so he was, um, you know, in regards to leadership, there was less pessimism uh, within him. And he was following the directions of, of leadership. And I think that was his orientation during that particular mm. you know, moment. He wasn't too in love even with the theology of the nation of Islam. I think his he uh, grabbed hold in, to the more psychological mechanisms of the sense of belonging mm. and the sense of uh, community and the sense of purpose. Right. Uh, so he wasn't too much hung on or hung up or in love with the, uh, the theology from his words, you know, from, yeah. you know, when I uh, questioned him on this. Yeah, I mean, I, would you say that that was pretty commonplace? Like it was more the attraction of the, you know, like the moral code, like you said, the sense of belonging, the sense of purpose, as opposed to the intricacies of the theology that really attracted people to yeah, the I nation mean, to begin with. It, it depends on who you talk to. Sure. You know, sure. so for example, you have, you know, some who they believe that Elijah Muhammad Although it's not, this is not just totally apparent in the theology, but they saw him as a God, you know. So especially with his passing, you know, they're they're like it shook up the very foundation of their belief in him as this divine, uh, you know, wow. creature. So wow. you know, you have you know many people. For example, you have uh, there's a group that I talked to. They thought they were going to uh, live forever because you know they're in good shape. They're uh, eating one meal a day, and you know some thought they were gonna live, uh, you know, forever. Um, so hmm. it just depends on who you talk to. Okay. You know, some uh, right. clung, you know, to uh, the belief system more than others. Others, uh, their, you know, uh, membership hinged on the psychological me mechanisms that were provided. Sure. Um, so I guess in the seventies, then, and in, 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 you know, back to California, uh, Southern California, how strong was the nation in in say S South LA, or or in that or in Southern California in general? Do you know? So you have Temple Twenty Seven, okay, and I, I would definitely say that organizations uh, that exist right now in Los Angeles, they're on the shoulders of Temple Twenty Seven. This is the temple that produced the likes of my father. Uh, also, you have, um, you know, who we know as Papa Shaw, and he's like, um, he's known for his security, uh, his sense of security. He's trained all of us in regards to security and making sure our community is uh, uh, secure. Um, you know, Imam Abdul Karim Hassan, you know, they're coming from Temple uh, 27. Okay. You know, so this is the place in regards to also Malcolm Malcolm X when he visited Los Angeles, um, he came in regards to um, you know some of the concerns that were happening, okay. especially around uh, police violence. You know, and um, you know what happened to the Watts. You right. know, um, well, you know what ignited the Watts riots was also uh, the police uh, murdered. That's right. Uh, Ronald T. Stokes, mm -hmm. you know, and Malcolm X, he came, he delivered one of his famous speeches in, in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the speech where he says, you know, who taught you to hate yourself, you know? Um, okay. And this particular, is it, just situating Malcolm during that time, you know, he was, uh, you know, pretty much fed up what was taking place in regards to the oppression on, on black people. This is what led to the, I would say, one of the things that led to the Watts uh, riots, you know, that took place. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Temple 27 is the, you know, foundation. Thank you, you for know, that. In Los Angeles, yeah. Where was that? Um, Do you know? Uh, it's on on Broadway, a street. In South L.A.? Like, yeah, so, South, South L.A. South L.A., yeah, okay. Yeah, on Broadway. Yeah. And I don't want I don't want to fast forward <laughs> in in terms of your story, but in terms of the temple, is it what is it now? Is it still a temple, or is it a ma? Is it a like a, a masjid? What is it? Well, Temple Twenty Seven. You know, a lot of these temples they transition into you know masjid. Uh, so I would definitely say uh, coming after that is uh, what is known now as the Bilal Islamic Center. Okay. You know, in that campus which they have right there on Central. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, I would say the former, formerly Temple 27. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 
So you mentioned, you know, something else, uh, I think at the outset, you mentioned the uh, Sister Claire Muhammad School. Yeah. Generally speaking, because I mean, you know, I, I had, I had, very close ties to the to the Imam Warthin community in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, we would go there all the time, and we spent a lot of time um, at their facilities. And there was a Sister Claire Muhammad, you know, mm -hmm. school there as well. Um, my my understanding is that I mean, uh, that was generally the way kind of the way the community was framed. Yeah, you had a masjid, then you had a school. Yeah, at minimum. Mm -hmm. but is that is that the case? I mean, is that is that the way Imam Warthin Muhammad wanted the community to be sort of found, you know, like the foundational being the masjid and the school. Yeah, I mean, this is what has motivated and inspired us. I mean, we grew up, we were tired of hearing stories. We we heard about the glory days from our elders. I see. And we heard about, you know, this, uh, this very beautiful time and moment in history. So this is, imagine, you know, I'm, I'm young, um, but this, these are the stories at every event. You have to hear about <laughs> the masjid, but also coupled with the school, you know, um, you yeah. know, as far as I mean, this was at one point the norm. You have your yeah. Sister Claire Muhammad school, but you also have your masjid. Um, so hearing this motivated us to get where we're at right now. Um, the stories that you know, at at one point we began to like, man, we're tired of hearing these stories. Uh, we need to embody. Right. These stories, so we can have our own narrative mm. instead of constantly referring back to what once was, you know. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. So, in terms of your youth, um, mm -hmm. so the, you weren't you weren't going to uh, an Islamic school and, and a mosque. It had th that foundation had disappeared by the time you were uh, growing up. Like the, the the Sister Clara Muhammad School found and and the. Um, the structure that that without that provided was that gone at the time you were growing up, but did you have or did you have that those resources growing up? So, what I know, so my sister, mm -hmm. um, you know, my older sisters, they definitely had an opportunity to attend Sister Claire Muhammad School. I was too young, so perhaps I was in the um, maybe uh, preschool or the you know. Uh, maybe a, ch a child care that mm -hmm. was available sure. during that time. Um, but yeah, at a certain point, the the building, um, you know, was, you know, th there was some structural issues in the building and they mm -hmm. ended up shutting down Sister Claire mm -hmm. uh, oh. Muhammad School. And they never and sort of reopened or relocated? No. Mm. There was there was some attempts, you know, I think they ended up uh, starting one in, in Compton. Yeah. And I, I don't think they got... Uh, enough support. There were some uh, individuals who started um, Sister Claire Muhammad uh, School, but you know, never they never got really received the support. So here I am. I'm going into public school. You know, I never forget. I'm in public school. Uh, it was maybe two Muslims, me and my sister, hmm. at the public school. So you know, I, I found myself, you know, having to develop two identities. You know, so one for the public school, which also has its language and has a uniform, uh, but also an identity um, uh, that has the language of the Muslims. MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, Assalamu Alaikum, so on and so forth. Um, but these were, um, uh, it, it's very dichotomous relationship between these two, mm -hmm. uh, you know, identities. They opposed each other, yeah. you know, so... Now the question, which one is going to win out? You know, that's, <laughs> and, that was the question. And I, being yeah. from LA, which is like the center of pop culture, what what were you like as a kid? What were you? What kind of things were you into? What things were influencing you uh, in that school persona? And then how did you balance those things with your at home at home uh, persona? Yeah, I mean, I was a product of uh, public school, and you know, the beautiful part about it, you know, I, just having a father who is an imam. You know, my father, you know, um, he gave me assignments that really kept me grounded. Um, you know, so for example, I sold my father's uh, tapes, you know. Um, he had you cassettes? Know, his, his lecture, his okay. cassette tape lectures. Yeah, like, so I had my cassette tape machine. Uh, I called the business Safir uh, Productions. Nice. And after Salatul Jumu'ah, I would line up and sell each tape for $5. And I had a line, um, and I had my box in which I collected 
And I would stay up uh, the night before making the labels. So I would print the labels, had nice labels on there, yeah. and I sold my father's uh, tapes. SubhanAllah. You're, you're bringing back memories for me um, of like, you know, those uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj cassettes that, yeah. you know, I grew up listening to um, with the labels. And um, you said $5. I think his he used to sell his cassettes for 6 But if you bought a box, you got like a discount. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a box, I think, came with like 10 or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're bringing back all these memories. Um, so you're, so uh, your, your father, when he becomes Imam, this is of the Bilal Islamic Center? So my father... Yeah, where does he serve Imam? And, and, and what okay. name does he take after he leaves the nation? Okay. Yeah. We so my father became uh, Sadiq Safir, which, you know, we call him Sadiq Safir, Imam Sadiq Safir, after coming out of the, the nation. There was in circulation, uh, Imam Wardi Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with him, he put uh, in circulation a name book. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, this name book was in... Many of the Muslim households okay. who had made that transition, and everybody began to choose their their names. So my father chose uh, Sadiq Safir, um, and um, my father he was the assistant imam uh, to Imam Abdul Karim Hassan. Um, like many of the communities around the country, um, there were maybe some you know disagreements on the direction of the organization. Um, there was a probably you know a, a lot of confusion and um, a lot of not you know not knowing where to go. Um, so there was uh, some disagreements. You know, as we see all around the country, my father and a group uh, of Muslims uh, they ended up uh, select you know selecting my father as the imam of that particular group. But uh, families they decided to leave that uh, particular location, uh, okay. you know, uh, we call it Masjid Bilal. Uh, they left and they went to one of the members uh, living room. So I remember we would have our Islamic studies in the living room of one of the, the members. Shout out to Mesa Abdullah. Um, I recently ran into his, his children. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I recent I, I ran into him not too long ago. Um, but in his living room, it started, and then they moved to a place called uh, Elegant Manor, which is located, it's now a historical location on Arlington um, in Los Angeles, and then they found this storefront, a small storefront, uh, which became Masjid Ibadullah, okay. and then they purchased the storefront next door to it, so it was there, it was two storefronts, one utilized as the brother's side and the other utilized as the, the sister's side, you know. So this was kind of the climb of uh, Mashri Bella. They they started at Mashri Bella in, uh, at that location in 1986, and they elected my father as the uh, imam. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So on your personal journey, when did you decide uh, you, you, you want to go down um, your father's path in a sense like mm -hmm. hey i want to this religion thing is is also for me uh and i want to uh, pursue my my studies in 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 that path or was that was that early was that much later yeah well you know if you ask me um during that particular time especially like uh around say uh throughout the 90s and everything mm -hmm. else um you know I'm, I'm just taking again the popular influences during that particular mm -hmm. time so i'm you know i'm of course uh, I'm Muslim, and Islam during that time was very simple, uh, you know, for me. We didn't know these huge terms that we use now from Aqidah, the uh, this group, this group, that mm -hmm. we didn't. We just knew the basics of Tawheed. I don't even know if we knew the word Tawheed. You know, we just knew Allah was one. That's right. Um, we didn't know anything about Tajweed and all. None of this. Islam was so simple uh, to us. Yeah. You know, my father was able to teach in a way, I mean, he was our, our fountain of Islam in uh, South Los Angeles. Mm. What we knew was his teachings. Um, and he was able to also uh, integrate uh, history and his teachings. Uh, so he was very relevant culturally um, in regards to his presentation of, uh, of Islam. And just looking back on it, you know, the emphasis wasn't the Arabic language. Um, however, he gave us the transliteration of many concepts that I ended up studying, 
you know, later on, like uh, uh, Usul, Usul al I, I looked at one of his his packets from the 90s, and he had in there um, Usul, and uh, he had Fiqh. He was defining it for people, and, you know, Madhab. He was teaching people uh, without complicating things, you know. So, yeah. uh, but during that time, I just loved this time. I loved being Muslim. If you ask me, was I going to be an imam? No, I would, and I was adamant. No way, you know. I, I grew up in the home of an imam. My my father, he wasn't uh, receiving any um, honorarium for his visit, visits to places. He wasn't receiving any type of salary. He didn't have it. He was an unsalaried imam. Uh, he was making uh, fifty dollars a week, you know. And I think he peaked out at a hundred dollars a week. Wow. Uh, so my father. And he had a pest control business. You know, my father would pick me up uh, from school. He had his his truck had uh, advertisement the number of his pest control right. uh, uh, business. You know, community pest control all around the truck. You know, I I I'd be like, hey, pick me up around the corner. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but my my father had a a business. He would um, and he would take me sometimes. He would. Uh, go and do some extermination at night, and that's how he paid bills. And he would also, uh, during the daytime, he was dealing with the issues of uh, the Muslim community wow. in the daytime, and also preparing for the khutbah on Friday. But we, my father is a dynamic speaker. Um, I mean, you know, he's a, he had in him, he's a product of Malcolm X. He loved Malcolm X. So uh, some people would hear him be like, man, is that Malcolm? You know, wow. is that the second coming of Malcolm? You know, my, my father, dynamic speaker. Have you archived those cassettes by any chance? We still, we still okay. have some okay. uh, cassettes. You need to archive them and, yeah, and, yeah. and maybe make it available digitally or something. You yeah, know, just... we, have to always, we have to put them, make, it, make yeah. sure that we uh, digitize them because uh, they're just cassettes, cassettes and they can be... Uh, Ruined. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a project you should definitely take on, or, or maybe yeah. yeah, somebody else in the family. Because yeah, that's something I'm 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 actively trying to do. Is I have this this. I mean, obviously nothing like you probably, but like I've got dozens and dozens of cassettes. Yeah. I want to try to digitize them, video content as well as audio. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of things. The one I wanted to kind of pick up on also the community in Southern California. How what was the relationship like between say the indigenous like community or the you know what came out of the um nation the Marathi and Muhammad community as well as the immigrant community in southern mm -hmm. california because i mean something we've our listeners have heard on this on this episode i mean on on this podcast we you know we've talked about the islamic center of southern california mm -hmm. We talked about Orange County. We just, there's these touch points in the community, uh, you know, leaders who had a national poll. Even yeah, yeah. people like Dr. Mazamal Zadiqi, Dr. Ahmed Sucker, uh, the Hatoud brothers, etc. Uh, and I know I'm forgetting others. But so, if you can maybe talk a little bit about that, like what that was like in the '80s or '90s, was that yeah. kind of a thing? Well, my father, he he he's a unifier. Mm -hmm. You know, he he's one of the founders of the Shore Council of uh, Southern California, okay, uh, which has become a model for the uh, entire country. It has, yeah. Yeah, so um, he had uh, beautiful relationships. I mean, I, I when I was younger, I would attend khutbahs at different masajid. Uh, my father made sure that he was breaking down barriers. Nice. And, you know, um, he was able to make, uh, build relationships. This was something that we watched my father uh, do. You know, he always, this was something that he's always emphasized for us. He didn't want us just to uh, stay to ourselves, um, uh, secluded in our little silo. You know, he wanted to make sure that we get out and build, you know, relationships with others. So we, we watched him uh, exemplify that, embody that, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, definitely, you know, Islam, even what it meant to be uh, uh, a leader in the community, I don't know if I even thought too much, too deeply into that until later on, you know. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing with the, uh, you know, other, as a matter of fact, I ran into one of my friends and we just looked at, our, we're products of the same thing. He's not Muslim, uh, but we're products of the same thing. We went through our phase. We wanted, we thought we were the next Michael Jordans, you know, we thought we were Bo Jackson, you know, uh, 
Uh, so we played basketball, uh, you know, football. Then we became hip hop heads, you know. So I, uh, you know, I, I was a rapper for a little bit. Um, and then I became a halal rapper, you know. <laughs> I started, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was, it was when a, you archiving those and put them, put them <laughs> out there, right? <laughs> you got those, How much were those tapes selling for? It, it, it's floating around here somewhere, you know. But I, I was really big into uh, the hip hop. We had uh, we had a little group uh, where we we would gather. Uh, one of our friends had a, a studio, mm-hmm. and that was a big time during that time. So the Eid. Um, this was, you know, before the whole conversation on uh, whether music is haram or, you know, hmm. but there was a big time when it's like at the Eid, I mean, that we we looked forward to the Muslim hip hop artists to come and do some oh, wow. uh, okay. sort of performance, you know, yeah. so we would, you know, do that. So, but, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, I mean, you know, I was into, uh, you know, I, the beautiful part about it is that... Um, you know, we as products of public school, we still found um, uh, uh, some utility in the Muslim community coming around and still seeing that, man, this is a beautiful uh, tradition to be uh, a part of, yeah. um, that you can allow your uh, the identities that you have uh, sort of gathered within the self in the public school environment, you can still exist in the, the Muslim community. Then the shift happened. You know, to where it's like, okay, hmm, there's more emphasis on, um, you know, the uh, on the uh, what's allowed and what's not allowed, the halal and haram, and you know. I was just about yeah. to go there because, like, what you're describing that Eid, like the, the the Eid scene you're describing, just seems so natural and organic. I mean, yeah. that's that it represented the history and the the trajectory of the yeah. community. Yeah. Then you've got these sort of then the voice you know then the voices start coming in right yeah like, yeah yeah uh, is music halal is music haram like so I guess my question to you around that was w- you think those are external like pressures or is that something that's just happening organically within the community because to me that's almost forgivable like the latter right mm-hmm. if it's something that the community is just naturally you know like the growth trajectory is now to talk about these sort of fiqhi or you know, issues yeah. of permissibility and impermissibility and so on, as opposed to, you know, outside influences coming in. And by that, I don't mean anything nefarious like the government or something, but you know what I mean? Like, but, but you know, what, what's happening in the broader Muslim community? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, of course, um, you know, as education and if emphasis on education uh, increase, which I, I think is always a good thing. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, with that it, comes, yeah, it comes <laughs> with some certain things, yeah. you know, that yeah. you have to make adjustments, right. you know, you in with any change, I mean, you're going to have to make some, uh, yeah. you know, some adjustments. So, you know, and you kind of, there's some time, a time period in which, um, people are susceptible to losing themselves a little and, uh, trying to figure out which, what direction fits. So true. You know, so I think we went through that that period. I mean, I never forget, we were at the, uh, there was a group of us at the Eid. And, you know, I mean, it was a big thing in having our chain, you know. But we had Allah. You know, I think I had uh, Allah with a, you know, I might have had a diamond in there, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it might have been a half of a little chip of a diamond, you know. Right. Um, blinged out a little bit. Yeah, we yeah. blinged out a little. Um, <laughs> and then my other friends, we were like, oh, man, what, you know, yeah. I'm going to get mine custom made, you know. Right. I mean, so, and then there's a time period, like you said, when there's a shift, right. you know, some of the uh, more fiqhi approach comes in. Right. Um, we removed our chains, you know. And then um, uh, music became more private. You know, you can't, it wasn't something that you turn up anymore. It's like, you look around, are there any <laughs> yeah, Muslims, exactly. you know, okay, now it's time. So there's a shift that uh, that happened. Now, this happens in the lifetime of Imam Warthin Muhammad? The shift that you're talking about, or does it happen, you know? I mean, he he, he passed away. I think towards, in towards... 2008, so yeah, that's much more end, recent. You know, yeah. yeah, towards the end, Okay. Um, there's I, I, I saw a shift that, you know, took mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it was, uh, you know... Um, more, you know, Salafi doctrine coming in, sure. uh, people getting, um, you know, scholarships to different, um, you know, uh, w- which is all good. I think, you know, for the most part, 
it's good for us to up education. Sure. Um, but that also comes with uh, certain things. Yeah. And um, like I said, with any type of shift, you know, people are may lose their way for a little bit yeah. uh, while trying to really adjust to see what's a comfortable uh, fit. You mm. know, so. Yeah. Um, but you know, yeah, it's definitely. I mean, I saw a shift even in, within my father. Okay. You know, uh, because there were more books being translated. Yeah. And you know, my father's. He's not. I mean, he's existing in a time, he's uh, an imam in a time when there was less emphasis on the Arabic language. That's right. You know, um, but he's an avid student and an avid avid reader, you know. Yeah. So um, my father, he was able to, you know, make, make some adjustments. But then the shift really became major, especially when it was time for me to, uh, you know, start studying. Yeah. You know, my father, um, there was a time when my father, he uh, he had a couple of major strokes, you know, so this is where I come in. Okay. Um, in the community, there was kind of this, uh, this um, you know, uh, uh, there's no leadership in the like community. A vacuum. Yeah, uh-huh. it's a vacuum. So, so my father, he's what we know. I mean, we, we only know his teachings, his approach. Yeah. He's very, uh, very balanced. He's dealing with um, former drug kingpins. He's dealing with uh, men and women who have done, um, you know, uh, years in prison. I mean, the years, if you add it up uh, between the men in the room, my father was dealing with men who had the injury of uh, mass incarceration. Um, He's dealing with uh, 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 present and former gang leaders. You know, so his approach you know, had to uh, uh, to reflect that this audience that he was yeah. uh, dealing with, you right? Know? So, and he did he did it uh, with brilliance, you know. So, I came to a point where I began questioning my father: Why did he do this? And then I find myself as I get older, the wisdom, finding the wisdom in his approach, yeah. And I understand it more than ever as there was a period where I, I, I wanted to do the opposite of him. That's right. And then as I get older, I'm finding myself. Uh, making similar decisions to what my father, you know, because he was older, you know, he was, uh, in, you know, I watched him as a leader in his late 40s and also in his 50s. And here I started off as an imam um, uh, around 25, 26, 27, yeah. very young. I'm still in my 20s uh, as an imam. Right. Uh, and I've, I've had to grow in my 20s and 30s and now right. uh, early 40s. I, I would imagine if you attended a khutbah of his, like you would you would you would hear, you know, verses from the Bible, from the Old mm-hmm. Testament, New Testament, and from the Quran. Yeah. And this and it was just natural and it was just you know, people it was fine everybody was fine with it. Yeah. I mean I used to marvel at that when I would go and attend yeah. khutbahs in the Imam Warthi Muhammad community in Houston because it was just the way it fl- the way it ebbed and flowed between navigating the Christian tradition as well as, you know, Islam. I, it, it, I was always fascinated by that. Yeah, yeah. It was no, seamless. Yeah. It was, you know, I'm sure that some of that also changes later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? There's almost like this, well, well, you know, like leaving off the ways of the past or whatever may be the case, like yeah, breaking yeah. that tie. Uh, and I imagine those pressures become more acute by the time you become imam. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another thing that always used to impress me uh, about the way the structures of the uh, it, within the Imam Warthi Muhammad community was, you had like kind of this model of like a youth Imam or an assistant Imam. Mm-hmm. Is that how you sort of come in the you know to the ranks? Like, are you like a youth Imam and then you become you know, kind of like in Christian churches, you have the youth pastor right who yeah, eventually yeah. right and, and and I think yeah. like lead lead us up to when that light yeah. bulb goes yeah, off for yeah, you, exactly. where you're like, okay, this is my mm-hmm. this is what I want to do. Yeah. So, well, I, I want to definitely say, so my father as an imam, he was surrounded by people. He gave people the title assistant imam and, you know, we okay. called them imam. I didn't understand it. You know, I, I would, even when I was younger, I'm like, why did my father give so-and-so the imam title? And, you know, what now as I get older, I'm like, you know, these are black males, Right in a very racialized environment 
who need competence, you know, who, who need to be built up psychologically. Validation. Yeah, yeah. validation. And, yeah. you know, um, and it gave them a sense of purpose, you know. So I understand it a lot more what my father was attempting to do, mm. you know. So he yeah. had some of the elders, he would give them imam titles, allow yeah. them to give the khutbah. And uh, sometimes we would sit back and like, ah. Why is he giving? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, when you're an imam in those environments, you have to understand is that, um, you know, the validation may not be coming from the work environment. It may not be coming right. from person's accolades and education. So to give them a, a title is also uh, a needed psychological uh, mechanism Beautiful. in the inner city. It elevates people. It brings people up. And, yeah, and then yeah. they... Yeah, they'll rise to the occasion. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. makes them, and it makes them more vested in the uh, the identity of being Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, in those areas, sometimes just being uh, just a, a lay member of a community may not be uh, robust enough for a person's uh, mm. self esteem, ego needs. You know, so uh, there's a lot to consider on the the approach of. The imams in the uh, inner city, um, yeah. but in regards to myself, so my father he had, and as a matter of fact, I'm at the masjid. He, my father's given the khutbah at Masjid Umar bin Al Khattab in front of uh, over a thousand people. Is that a different masjid? Not yeah, this his. is a different masjid because yeah. so my he, father would go yeah. around different right. locations. And you're right. talking like late '90s, early 2000s. Yes, yeah, so I would say uh, this was. Um, Early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Early 2000s. So I would say around 2003, 2002, mm -hmm. 2003. Okay. So I'm in the audience. My father, um, he begins just sweating profusely. Mm -hmm. You know, he began mm -hmm. sweating a lot. Um, and then at a certain point in the khutbah, he, he sat down. He was having a, a stroke in the middle of the khutbah. I, I never forget. I went up to him and I removed the my, uh, my shirt. I had an undershirt on. And I just, you know, was wiping his forehead. He was sweating so much, but he wouldn't stop giving the khutbah. So he's he's giving the khutbah, and um, uh, he 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 finally ends it. And then the paramedics were was waiting for him outside wow. um, to take him immediately, or take him to the, you know, the, the the hospital. You know, so so my father, you know, that that was a big shocker in the community. I mean, that that shook us up. I mean, this was our source of Islam. In the, uh, in the inner city. My father, at Mashiri Babala, um, at on a given day, my father was friends with Muhammad Ali. So you may see Muhammad Ali in the audience. Mm. You may see, um, we've seen, there was an actor named Daryl Savad, and he, he would bring Tommy Davison, and uh, I prayed next to Mike Tyson. You know, <laughs> Tribe Called Quest, you know, right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, you right. know, at the, uh, at the, at the masjid. So all these individuals, I mean, my father had very powerful khutbahs. I mean, we were in there squeezed in, you know, like sardine can, you know. Um, like a, it was like a packed house it was a, on it a was Friday. A packed house, yeah. Okay. And this was this was before some of the bigger, um, you know, almost mega masajid were built. Your reliance was on the storefront. The mm. storefront has been you know, powerful staple in the inner city. So you know? true, yeah. I mean, a whole study can be done across the country on the impact of the storefront uh, masjid. You That's know? Right. Actually, talk, talk a little about that for, yeah. I don't think everybody, under, you're talking about a store that turns into a like a mosque at prayer times? Yeah, so it's, it's being, a lot of times it's being leased out. Yeah. And many a times... So it, it's, yeah. it's a masjid, it's just that the space is usually used for retail stores. Yeah, yeah. okay. So it's like, not, it doesn't operate as a store anymore. Yeah, it's it. just that the space is built out got for retail. It. Yeah, got But it. in the inner city, that is where a lot of these massages grow from. Like, I mean, I've been to, yeah. like, we were talking off mic, but you know, when Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn mm -hmm. begins as a storefront begins mosque, store. Imam Siraj's. Uh, I've been in Imam Jamil's community, and got it was it. the very same thing in, in, yeah. in downtown Atlanta. So yeah. you, you had these um, these uh, structures mm -hmm. in the community, uh, in the inner cities, and that was the mm -hmm. space available to you to build or to have your masjid. You couldn't build from the yeah. ground up, like you, yeah, yeah. like you were saying, these mega mosques that mm -hmm. come later. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. there's small places. Yeah. Um, at masjid Battle, the roof was falling down. We had a makeshift uh, air conditioning unit right above the door in which uh, one guy, he came in, he said, man, you guys are 
inhaling fumes with wow. this thing right above the door, you know. Right. Um, I mean, where one time we were praying and a mouse came and joined the ranks. <laughs> you know? Right. So we, we have moments like that. But, um, you know, we're produced out of the storefront. There's, there's very special <laughs> moments that you end up experiencing from uh, Islam in the store, you know. Uh, so true. Uh, you know, in the storefront. However, the storefront also comes with the, uh, almost a, you know, a, a storefront uh, mentality. Hmm. Um, in order to to see a shift in the mentality, you, you almost have to change the facility. You know, what is that mentality? If you could, you know, flesh that out a little bit more. Yeah, it, you know, sometimes it's it's a lot of drama. There was at one time, you know, we experienced a lot of divorces um, that were happening. Um, a lot of times, it's you know the the imam. There's so much that's placed on the imam. Uh, there begins to be a uh, become an unhealthy dependency on the imam. Unfortunately, in these areas, because it's underfunded, under resourced, um, there's not uh, the experience that's that's needed in regards to board members um, and also running the five hundred one c three, the nonprofit organization. Um, you know, so you have there's a lot of uh, deficiencies in regards to that model. So you. You hope that you're able to, you know, shift when you outgrow that model, you know. So yeah. I think we stayed in the storefront a little too long. You know, long. Um, yeah, but, you know, so I, so I came along as a, started off as a board member. Oh, okay. And I was, I think I was, I was fed up at a certain point, you know, on how things were functioning hmm. in the community. And I started going to some of the uh, the bigger establishments because the storefront, I mean, the storefront facility, if, if you don't see growth, and this is what's happened, I think, with a lot of African-American communities around the country. Yeah. If communities stay stagnant, then the first to go are the uh, the young people. Mm -hmm. You know, the young people love the energy of, uh, of growth and also um, enhanced membership, you know, when it's more, like they say, a crowd brings a crowd, you know, yeah. so once the crowd disperses, you know, especially with the young people, they, they love the energy of the, uh, right. you know, the crowd. So, um, now so, when you were a board member, were you already in school? Like you were, like you were doing your undergrad or uh, what does that look okay. like? So let's get into this. So, yeah. uh, coming out of high school, I went into barbering, you know, so I was, I was a barber um you've been, in Los you really Angeles. have been a jack of all trades <laughs> yeah yeah so I, I mean and i'm not just any barber you know I, okay <laughs> i was putting it down i was putting it work in, in regards to the barber shop you know but i i, I worked in well i i can see uh, that your beard is on point so yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm my uh my my only customer right now <laughs> right. so all, all your attention goes into into one one place there yeah, it goes right yeah, there no, it's perfect it's yeah. perfect I, yeah so and i let i let a lot take care of my uh, my head you know <laughs> haircut you know both <laughs> but, of us don't worry yeah yeah but um but you know the barber shop is this is my early foundation hmm. and uh what is the irony now so i began the first barbershop that I began working at is called Unfatables on Crenshaw Slauson. And I would drive past this big green building on my way home, right? And we ended up later on uh, purchasing the big green building. Um, and that's where Isla Academy, Isla LA is located oh, right man. now. Okay. But I had no idea that that would eventually become our, right. our space, our center. Um, you know, so I started, but it, that, that was my foundation. I had a barbershop called Sheer Talent on uh, Crenshaw and, and Rodeo. Now the street is known as uh, Barack Obama, but I was on Crenshaw and Rodeo. I had a, a barbershop um, and it was me and my friends. Uh, we started the, uh, the barbershop. That, that area is known for barbers. In salons, right? On you, Crenshaw. Yeah. You, you've talked about the storefront and what that means. I, I think it's worth noting what the barbershop represents and yeah. what that kind of means in the, you know, in the inner city. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an institution. It's an institution. Communal institution. Yeah. The, the barbershop, I mean, this is, for me, it was a powerful training. 
Yeah. You know, so I look at my father and um, the training that I received from, you know, my father, my father selling his tapes. Um, I, I would type my father's notes, you know, um, oh, okay. so that was the training for me. But also I'm um, also I'm deep in the beauty industry, uh, cutting, you know, a couple of celebrities um, local politicians. Okay. You know, so I had the local uh, councilman and also his family. I'm cutting their hair. And um, at one point, I'm even before opening the barbershop, I was able to transition into my own shop because I was working for a location and I had the most clientele mm. uh, at that uh, particular location in the uh, Crenshaw Mall, which was the Baldwin Hills uh, Plaza. Um, so... I, I learned a lot from the barbershop. This is where I, I got some skills in regards to, I guess we, we would term pastoral care, you know, because people would sit down in the chair and and just spill all of their the issues that they have or, you know, uh, relationship problems, and they would need advice. Um, so I was able to get, you know, um, some imam training <laughs> at, right there as a, uh, as yeah. a barber. You know, I, I saw a funny meme recently where it was, you know, before Google, you know, and they show, I think it's like from a Leslie Nielsen movie or mm -hmm. something. It's like from Naked Gun. Okay. But he gets all of his information, his intel from the shoeshine guy, you know, who was where and when, you know, that was like before Google, you, you just go to the shoeshine guy. Th that was kind of like with the barbershop. I mean, like you That's, mentioned yeah. pastoral care before there was something even known as pastoral care, yeah, yeah. but it was happening organically right there as people waited to get their cut. Yeah. I mean, it, it's right there. <laughs> The barbershop, you're discussing all the cultural issues. <laughs> right. You know, um, you know, we're discussing from business uh, to sports yeah. to relationships. And you're seeing the different angles that, uh, you know, uh, in different perspectives and different approaches just on the black experience, you know, right, right there in the barbershop. I, I know it's been played out, but I mean, obviously you've got the franchise, the Ice Cube franchise but barbershop, which is, I mean, remarkably really yeah. good. It's yeah. actually, you know, some really good movies in there. And then I also, of course, you think about like coming to America and yeah. like the, bar yeah. the famous barbershop scenes. Yeah. And, but that's really, that's not too far from the truth. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. That, no, that's, that's uh, real. It's an institution of uh, right. cultural production. I mean, yeah. you have right there where your ideas are shaped right there in the barbershop. You know, you, you, you have to develop, um, you know, some thick skin. Right. Because it's also a, it's a place where, you know, people may harp on your uh, weaknesses in regards to how you dress and, you know, mm. uh, how you look. So you have to develop little skills <laughs> on, on that. So Get ranked out. Yeah. 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 Your and social skills are yeah. going to be enhanced right there. Uh, dealing with the people in the barbershop. <laughs> and and this there's volume in there. Like people yeah. are coming through. So it's yeah. you're probably making you're making a living, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so at a relatively young age. Yeah. So what what makes you say mm, okay, this is great, but I want to try something different. Yeah. What's that what's that moment? Yeah, you for me it became such a daunting task to come in every Saturday and watch I mean customers they would they would get into it with each other. I, you know, I would have a list of clients that I had to make sure that... Uh, they didn't overlap? Oh, man, it was overlapping. I was uh, My, uh, yeah, my like appointment a... system was breaking down. It, I mean, it was just getting... Yeah. It was getting so busy and it was getting out of hand. Mm. Uh, but the barbering business was good to me. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot for that experience. I mean, I'm, I'm early 20s. I'm... 19, 20, 21, 22. That's amazing. With you, money in my pocket. Yeah. You know, um, you're an entrepreneur at that I'm age. Entrepreneur. I had yeah. a, a condo in Inglewood. So I have property mm. and everything else. So I was able to yeah. put money aside. I had a nice car. Um, so, you know, I, the barbering business was good to the, me. At, right? at that age, it's not much more than you want. Than, yeah, yeah. No, it's not much. Car, <laughs> money, <laughs> car. Yeah. yeah. Got my right. uh, little. A lot changed. <laughs> yeah. Blinging out a little bit more. Yeah, blinging yeah. out a little, you know. Um, but yeah, something yeah. happened. You know, I, I watched my father, uh, you know, of course, his... Uh, health issues. Yeah, his health issues. Is what drew you. Um, and then there was uh, a need in the Muslim community. Okay. Um, we watched, you know, there was kind of a vying for uh, leadership during that particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, some things uh, took place, and I'll never forget... Um, I ended up performing uh, Umrah. So before that, I was already, I was given the khutbah. You know, this is like early 20s. And I, uh, oh, I ended up 
some things happened in my life. Um, so one of them is that, you know, my friend was killed in uh, Altadena mm. or in uh, Pasadena. But, uh, so Altadena, by the way, is like a city adjacent it's right to next Pasadena. To, yeah, yeah, Pasadena. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. But he because w- Pasadena is pretty diverse community, right? Yeah, is yeah. Al- is Al- Altadena a little bit more like African American? Um, it's no? pretty much diverse. Oh, so diverse. Okay, and a lot okay. of a, a lot has changed. Okay, I bet uh, it's, it's very mean, expensive now. And uh, yeah, I mean, so. we yeah, Pasadena is yeah. pretty like yeah. We hung bougie. out there. Yeah, 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 now yeah, it's considered yeah. really bougie. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. a different in. Uh, <laughs> But there's an area in which you have there's a there was a higher concentration of African Americans. Okay. And there was a good you know African American middle class there. You know, so my okay. my parents were a part of this African American middle class there. Got it. Uh, as was you know I have you know a few friends. Um, Sorry, you were talking. Friends, you were yeah. talking about your friend who who was was killed in Altadena. Yeah. So yeah. my 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 friend uh, was killed. Um, he was involved in in gangs. Um, however, um, and then I, I I look at what he went through, and it informs also uh, my approach. Sure. You know, as an imam, and also as a, uh, an imam in the inner city. Um, so my my friend, he grew up with me in the Muslim uh, community. So every Sunday we would go to our Islamic studies class. You know, he also uh, grew up in Pasadena. Uh, we would get in the car and go to the Islamic studies class, and uh, so he was my good friend. Um, he ended up uh, being, uh, you know, shot. He ended up being murdered, and his mother uh, um, called on me to do his the washing and shrouding, yeah. and um, that was definitely, you know, life changing, uh, you know, for me. Right. Um, so that that particular event you know, absolutely changed me, you know. Um, and I look back on it and, you know, I mean, you, you go through certain things that you go through in life, you know, and uh, I, I mean, I was absolutely frightened. I didn't want to do, I didn't want to see him in that um, state, you know, that's, I didn't want to see him in that state. But when I did see him in that state, I, I remember, um, you know, feeling a little panic uh, just internally, um, but it settled and something else happened it, it kind of transformed me mm. you know experience in that um so alhamdulillah I'm, I'm grateful his mother uh you know chose me as a part of that uh that group right you know to have that opportunity you know death is something that it purifies the heart and to see one of your your, your peers and someone who yeah. um you know you has a status in you know certain status sure. in your heart sure um, so that, I mean, that brought me close to reality okay. and also, you know, I was able to perform a uh, Hajj. So my mother, uh, my, my mother and also father were able to contribute to, um, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I guess the Hajj packages were a lot cheaper <laughs> yeah. during that time, but, you know, I was able to perform Hajj. Okay. And, um, uh, while I was on Hajj, alhamdulillah, I was, uh, I was sitting in a group and they were reading Quran. What year is this? This was, I think, 2005. Okay. 2005. 2000, I think maybe we left 2005, came back in 2006. Oh, gotcha. So it was like end of December. December. You know, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so we came back. Well, um, while I was there, they were flowing through the uh, the Arabic and everything else. And by that time, I I gave a couple of uh, khutbahs, right? So... I thought I was, I thought I was pretty <laughs> learning, and I'm watching these young guys, man, flow mm-hmm. through the Quran and right. everything else. So I said, when I come back, I'm, I have to do some studying. Mm. So, you know, I ended up coming back, and uh, immediately, my, I just wasn't comfortable no more in that barber shop. You know, um, I felt I was like, man, I'm, I'm wasting time. I need to study. You know, um, so Alhamdulillah, I was able. I went to a program. I mean. Uh, I ended up going to a program. Um, my grandmother stayed next door. I went to visit my grandmother one summer, and she stayed next door to uh, a masjid. Uh, and this is in uh, in Texas, in uh, um, Humble, Texas. And uh, I went to visit, and they were reading Quran. Mm. And I was like, man, I want to read like that. So the, I, I ended up going home and then coming back. I said, well, I'll live with my grandmother and then... So you, go here and memorize Quran, and you lived in uh, you lived in Umbul. 
Yeah, just, it, it wasn't that long. Okay, okay. Because some that's... complications happened. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it was like over the summer. So for those who don't know, that's like a suburb of Houston. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a suburb yeah, of yeah. Houston. So, uh, but I don't. I'm not familiar with that particular center or anything yeah. uh, in Humble. Um, but uh, so you're there for a short amount of time, but then the the I guess the spark is there to now learn and to yeah. devote your energies into really learning Islam. Yeah. So. Um, so one of the things, so when I came back from uh, Hajj, um, there was a, a shift that happened also in Los Angeles. Okay. And, you know, when I look back on it, I guess when you're sitting in it, it's, it causes confusion. You're like, what is happening? Mm -hmm. You know, it causes, you know, just heightened emotions, whether it's anger or whatever. Um, but yeah, and, you know, um, individual came into the community and... Um, you know, really shook up the community, but it was some exposure that I think we needed. So now, and I'm reminding you all, you know, I think before I mentioned coming up under my father, I mean, it's very simple. Yeah. You know, now we get introduced to um, uh, the different madahib, you know. Oh, so the person who kind of shook up the community, th th this isn't like external, like government interference. That's, that's another story. Well, this is something else. It might be. We don't know. Okay, you know. I mean, I, I, okay. I'll, I'll, okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. same person. Yeah. And so, shifted the kind of conversations that were happening in the community. Yeah. Yep. Because I mean, let's just say it. I mean, like agent provocateur, right? Kind of comes into the community. Yeah. It kind of ignites these conversations that otherwise people weren't even you know privy to or having. Yeah. About complex fiqhi issues or aqidah issues or whatever it may be. Yeah, and, and I think I think Hajj, um, my exposure on Hajj when I, you know, um, listening to people read and see that there's a actual uh, formula and there's rules to follow and then coming uh, home and hearing about these different categories and that yeah. there's uh, tajweed, you know, hearing about this for the first time. Uh, the different category, you know, all of these things. Sure. And then hearing about, uh, um, you know, more of a classical approach to Islamic studies. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it all caught me all by surprise, you know. And, and then, um, you know, being just mesmerized by, you know, uh, you know, people able to, there was an individual I watched, I mean, he's African-American. So I'm like, how is this person able to speak Arabic like this, you know? Um, so being exposed to that, you know, where now you have African-Americans with overseas experience, uh, you know, being exposed to that, um, it contributed to, I think, feelings within my, just lowered my self-esteem. And I said, man, I, I my self-esteem, I feel like I'm unqualified. I don't need to give a khutbah. I don't need to teach a class anymore yeah. until I, I get a teacher. Are yeah. you seeing at the same time um, a bit of converging of the like the African-American community with the immigrant community or other communities? Or is it still yeah. very much um, separate? Mm. I presume in the 80s and 90s is more separate than than not right by the yeah. time you like in the 2000s you're talking about yeah but you know i think so there was a time period so my father's going to different locations but i'm not i'm not building that many relationships you know okay. I'm, I'm going to listen to my father yeah and he is uh, satiating our desire for islamic studies i mean he's giving us what we felt that uh what we need you know and um i mean he was he Pretty balanced. It was a practical approach and everything else. Um, it, wasn't no over, over, overly emphasis on uh, over emphasis on the Arabic language and these other sciences, aqida and all this stuff. He just said, "This is Islam." More right. practical than yeah, 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 it's more practical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, so as we uh, got more exposure mm -hmm. from the different characters that began to visit LA, because we're in LA, we're we're in our own yeah. bubble island you know so to speak so whatever's present in, in la this is what we feel you know this is our exposure to uh islam you know so as you know we begin to uh get exposure to seeing especially some african-americans who can speak the arabic language um 
uh, you know, someone came in and introduced uh, Ruwaya to Warsh mm. and Hafs. Right. Uh, been awesome. You know, they, I mean, they're introducing these things and we're like, we've never heard of this. What is this? You know? <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, uh, so figure in Los Angeles was uh, Sheikh Jamal Adin. Okay. So Sheikh Jamal Adin, I mean, he's from the hood. He's from Los Angeles area, you know? Um, and he's like a, a local historian. He knows what has taken place in Los Angeles. He knows the different groups, different factions, um, what has taken place historically in the African-American and Latino community uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, Sheikh Jamal Adin, I mean, he was a, a jewel. Um, so I, mean, I ended up... Is he still with us? No. Okay. No, okay. Uh, Sheikh Jamal Adin, he, he passed away. Okay. May Allah have mercy upon him. I mean... I mean. Um, Sheikh Jamal Adin, rahmatullahi alayhi, now, Sheikh Jamal Adin, um, he was a linguist, you know. So you, when you would encounter Sheikh Jamal Adin, you would think he spent years overseas. But I think he just had a brain in which he was able to absorb, uh, you know, different languages. And, wow. and I mean, and he loved Islamic studies. Um, so he introduced us to the uh, like Mutun, you know. Um, like for example, uh, uh, Ajrumiya, uh, the Alfiya, Qatar and Nada. He inter he was a connoisseur of the Arabic language. Yeah, these are classical grammar texts for yeah. those who yeah yeah. So he he introduced us to. I mean, we've never heard of these things before. Right. And this is what made me put it on. I mean, I I began. I'm like, man, I can't sleep anymore. I have to catch up. <laughs> you know, I'm starting these things, and I'm in my twenties already. I have to catch up, you know, um, and I found myself just, you know, Sheikh Jamal Adin would print, go to uh, Kinko's, and um, have bring me back a folder with books, you know. So he he bought me the Ajrumia. We were able to go through the uh, Ajrumia. He introduced me to uh, to Sarf, you know. So uh, and I'm like, where has this stuff been? Wow, you know, yeah. um, grammar. I mean, he introduced me to uh, Sheikh Jamal Adin. We would be sitting around, and then we we may run into another Imam with maybe some overseas experience. So Sheikh Jamal Adin, he might start reciting the Alfiya. Uh, um, you know, so so, and you're saying this this individual like he's from this he's from the inner city, but he yeah. hadn't spent a lot of time overseas. No, he just he didn't had spend this no time acumen over. to grab all this, grasp yeah. all this. What is he in the community though? Like, is he does he is he affiliated with a masjid? Is he an imam? That was always, you know, I always wonder, like, why isn't Sheikh Jamal ad an right. imam somewhere? Yeah. Um, but that's not that was never his interest. Okay. You know, he's a teacher. Right. Um, right. You know, he was he's, he's like, man, I'm not fit to be an imam anywhere. You know. Um, and I think, you know, he's, he spent a lot of time, he's a product of the community, Yeah. you know, also. So uh, there was some issues I know that probably he was working out internally within himself. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, he, he wasn't interested in regards to being an imam anywhere. But uh, he was definitely, he was our, our, our teacher. Beautiful. Um, and I, I got an opportunity that was for a while. Especially when, when I uh, came back from Hajj, there was at a point. Uh, where I ended up leaving uh, to study, I remember uh, left for you know maybe the summer, and then came back with you know maybe a, a Jews of Quran or something, and I now knew about Tajweed, knew some Tajweed, I ran into the book Tuhfat um, Atfal, uh, this uh, this beginning Tajweed primer, and then so uh, I'm with Sheikh Jamal Adin, I stopped going to the barber shop. I go straight to the internet cafe and hang out with Sheikh Jamal Adin, and we're studying all day. Wow! So I've had, I have access to him all day. We would go to a restaurant and get uh, food, maybe in Little Ethiopia, and he's speaking uh, Amharic or he's speaking the uh, language with the Ethiopians, right? Wow! Uh, we would sometimes study all day, then go to a Mexican restaurant. And here, uh, Sheikh Jamal Adin began speaking Spanish, you know. 
And then we would uh, some days go and get some food uh, from the you know local Pakistani restaurant, and he's speaking Urdu. You know, <laughs> he's fluent in all of these languages. Wow. Like we, we've never right. seen a yeah. Sheikh Jamal Dean. Like you know, he was one of a kind. That's You'll right. never be exposed to. And he's constantly. He's like I have a whole section in my library on these folders that Sheikh Jamal Dean would bring me of different books, you know, different texts. So I was able to spend a lot of time. There was a period of time which I would be at the uh, the internet cafe, sitting there with Sheikh Jamal Dean all day. We go get lunch and come back and study, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely cherish that time, right. and I cherish the exposure that he he gave me. He was one of those uh, figures who had a great impact um, on uh, the educational environment in uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know. And you were fortunate to spend how much time with him. So Sheikh Jamal ad um, there was at least a period in there. It's like, uh, um, so at a certain point, I had to uh, go to work and uh, and make sure I uh, pay my bills because I'm was, I was married at the time. Okay. Um, but there was at least a year of me and him uh, for extended period of time. And then after that, um, uh, about two to three years of just continuous study. Okay. But it wasn't as frequent as that that uh, that period of time where I was able to spend uh, at least, you know, at least that year with him, you know, so. Right. Mm -hmm. And so take us to your, to your education, your formal education. No? Yeah. 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 So interestingly, um, you know, I think, especially uh, after 9-11, um, there was programs springing up around the country that were teaching, you know, what they would call, uh, Arabic studies, you know, you would learn the language and also the Arabic culture, you know, and maybe that was the, they were attempting to attract maybe law enforcement or people who were going into interpreting uh, in regards to, because a lot of focus was on the Middle East, yeah. you know, right. and the uh, Arabic countries. Um, so there was a program that started up at, I think, in San Bernardino, but also National University. Um, so I ended up, uh, a lady came and she was recruiting, um, well, someone uh, let us know there's a new Arabic program. All we saw was Arabic, you know. Uh, we want to learn Arabic, you know. And at that time, I wanted to go overseas. I felt so deficient as an imam that um, I couldn't go anywhere. My father, um, I was, you know, my father was with me, you know, so I can't just go and leave, you know. And yeah. then also... As new, newly married, have a child, and everything else, I can't just go overseas like my friends, you know. So, but they started this uh, this program at National University. Uh, so I'm sitting there, um, you know, learning Arabic with people in the army, and mm. uh, it was an interesting environment. The the beautiful part about it was Muslim teachers. Uh oh, okay. um, we were able to uh, learn a good amount of grammar. It was a nice program. They immersed us in uh, Arabic, you know, uh, for a while. And, um, you know, I mean, um, it, that was a good program. So they offered a BA. So I ended up finishing that program with, uh, you know, a BA in uh, Arabic studies. Okay. And then uh, you, you, do you go on to your master's right away? Yeah. So my plan then was to go to Malaysia. So I, I thought there was a, this uh, program. Not the uh, Islamic University, somewhere else? No, um, Islamic University of uh, Malaysia. Malaysia, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, and then uh, Bayan was, I think, in its early uh, years, uh, or it, uh, it was just starting up. So I went to an information session for uh, Bayan, and um, they offered me, I remember getting a phone call uh, on the day of Eid, and they... Uh, um, offered me a, a scholarship. Scholarship, the, yeah. yeah. So um, I was like, man, this is a beautiful aid program. You was know. that the Muhammad Ali like scholarship? No, nah, this they was have? before all this of that. This is before that. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. But I remember before. hearing about it from Jihad. So I mean, yeah. who's been on the show? Sorry, another Jihad, Jihad Turk. Yeah, I should, yeah, I yeah. Clarify. Definitely. Yeah, uh, matter of fact, uh, yeah, yeah. President Jihad Turk called me. Okay, and uh, yeah. to offer me that uh, that scholarship. Mashallah, yeah. So you yeah. mentioned a, a pretty interesting topic for your masters. Yeah, uh, <laughs> tell us about that, and we'll, we'll dive into that. Yeah, so so my just before you know the masters, it was like a culture shock. So at that time, I know um, 
I think I was an indirect recipient of also what was taking place uh, um, at, the, I guess, the old Zaytuna. Uh, uh, one of the brothers, uh, uh, Sheikh Mujahid Abdul Karim, he was able to, uh, I think he moved to the Bay Area in order to, um, you know, to be a part of the older Zaytuna. And then I think he ended up going to Mauritania. And he was from Inglewood. Oh. So he was, uh, you know, he was someone I saw in the community. He was my homeboy. Um, so he brings in, now he's another one, just like Sheikh Jamal Adin and others, who now brings in, now he's he's uh, muddying the waters, you know. <laughs> Even with, more. Yeah, yeah Akida, you know, he's bringing in all these concepts. And, you know, he brings in, uh, oh, you need to study this text on uh, Maliki Fiqh and, and everything else. Um, so I, I I was able to sit and and uh, you know really benefit from you know what he was able to uh, to study at least some of the beginning Maliki books. Um, so here I'm sitting in this program you know for uh, Bayan mm. we do our Islamic studies at the Claremont Graduate School. Right. So we're learning you know uh, some of the works of the Orientalists. And also uh, staunch critics on Islam, you know. So this was a shock for me, yeah. you know. So I'm I'm sitting here now, having to really question the foundation of my very belief. I mean, I, I I'm listening to these critics um, who are in the professional vocational field of Islamic studies, um, you know, writing these uh, you know these tr long treatises on uh, on Islamic on Islam, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. I'm I'm having to really confront everything that I've learned. You know, I'm having to confront everything that I've learned reading from uh, you know, some of these texts. So right. that sent me it, and that was a necessary uh time that uh because I, I think I was so romantic about um the tradition and you know, um you know, also the uh, you know classical scholars sure. and everything. I was had a very romantic relationship, and I was on my way to attempting to import um, uh, a different time period and everything to South LA, my, <laughs> and uh, that kind of broke it down. Yeah. Which was, uh, so what you got at Bayon sort of tempered that. Yeah, a little it, bit. it tempered that. It, um, it was a hardship at first. I yeah, mean, it was. It was at, at that time, or I, maybe this is still the case. So tell us a little bit about that program. Is, it's like it's a, is is it a two year graduate program? Um, yes. Okay, so two, two years, years, and it's uh, it's changed now. Okay, what did it used to be when you this were was there? at? Right. Okay, so yeah. this is like for for example now. So as a professor, I do um, you know courses that you know you may have a hybrid course where. Um, you know, people, they spend, you know, time online, you know, they okay. have, there's a, uh, a few sessions online, and then we meet for an entire week. That's right. That's how, person. when you attended. No, when oh, I attended. Oh, okay. It wasn't that's like... how it is now. Okay. Uh, when I attended, I mean, it was like, you know, regular, uh, you know, graduate school. You oh, know, oh um, so like a, you went to a brick and mortar. Yeah. You went yeah. to like a classroom and, and everything. Yeah. So we I would think... go to... Claremont School of Theology, yeah. in between, you know, you have those those schools over there in the consortium of colleges. That's uh, right. But you know, we did our Islamic studies also with, um, we spent some time with uh, um, the professor there, Hamid Mavani. Um, and ha Hamid Mavani in the classroom, I mean, he's bringing up very controversial topics. And we're sitting there, you know... Um, you know, used to the the masjid setting, right? That these aren't hot topics in the masjid, for sure. And we're having to confront um, Islam and its relationship, also with slavery, um, uh, Islam and the the uh, um, uh, patriarchy and all of this yep. these things that we yeah. have having to confront. And I mean, it was very uncomfortable, uh, you know, for me oh, initially. Yeah. Or early Muslim history. Yeah, yeah. That's the early Muslim rocky. history, yeah. and uh, I mean, we're having, we're talking about this openly, mm -hmm. and you're hearing opinions that are oppositional to yours, and it's like, I'm not used to that. I'm an imam in the masjid, you know, at that at that particular time. Right, I hear you. You know, so yeah. um, you know, so that was a, uh, an awakening. So yeah, in that spirit. And I was like, okay, we're going to get controversial. You don't, you embraced it. <laughs> I embraced it, and uh, I wrote to complete my master's. I wrote a thesis on 
polygyny in the African American uh, community. You know. Okay. And um, you know, I just ex- explored: is this something that is, uh, you know, something that is viable? Is this a viable institution for the uh, African American Muslims? So, uh, you know, I approached it from, you know, looking at the exegesis of certain uh, uh, verses or the tafsir of uh, certain uh, ayat in the in the Quran. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, you know, I look at it from other traditions, uh, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and then, um, you know, um, you know, seeing, is it, you know, answering the question, is it a viable institution for, you know... African-Americans the, specifically? Yeah. Okay. Specifically African-Americans. Now, how prevalent, you know, is it as a practice even in the black community? Well, I mean, it's, it's probably less prevalent uh, now... Um, but it still takes place. And unfortunately, um, uh, the more that it remains, uh, you know, sort of in the closet. Taboo. Stig- yeah. Taboo. Yeah. 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 Stigmatized, yeah. taboo, et cetera. Yeah. The more people, uh, you know, are deprived of their rights, you know, mm. and you know yeah. who are involved in it. Absolutely. In, in particular, the women and the, and the children. You For know? sure. So, For sure. You know, I, I would definitely say that, um, uh, the example of polygyny in the African American Muslim community uh, definitely uh, there's some work that's uh, needed, mm. and there's some real conversations, some difficult conversations that need to take place um, uh, to really uh, interrogate um, whether or to really question whether it is a viable institution or uh, or not. Um, will that stop it from? You know, whatever conclusion that is reached, will it stop it from happening? No. Uh, perhaps not. Right. But you know. it may set up some guardrails yeah. where it can be practiced ethically and, and where people's rights are met. Yeah. It, you, you know, even though it may not be recognized by the state, you can still ensure certain rights for, yeah. you know, um, the spouses and the people involved yeah. in in, yeah. in uh, the community where we come from, as the South Asian, it, it's it, there's no. a major stigma. Oh right? yeah, yeah, and um, well, I was gonna say like, yeah. I mean, uh, the only instances I used to hear about polygamous relationships in the community would be the one-offs, either and, and it was either Black American or mm-hmm. it was maybe maybe uh, among the Arab community, yeah, completely yeah. non-existent and. Highly stigmatized, yeah. In our Desi, yeah. In uh, Desi, you know, if Indo- somebody did it, it was like, oh, oh no, like, for sure. That was, yeah, yeah. yeah. Indo Pakistani community. Yeah. Um, and then there's a broader conversation also to be had about, I think, just you know, divorce and remarriages and yeah. all of that as well. I mean, a, a lot of those issues tend to be stigmatized, especially yeah. for women yeah. with children. Mm. You know, and and the kind of stigmas that they face as opposed to, I think, you know, men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the, the guardrails. I, I want to dig into yeah. it just a bit more. It's really Please. fascinating. Yeah. So the guardrails that could make this a beneficial practice. You mm-hmm. do you think those are people are practicing those or ignorant of those or just not successful at practicing what they know? Like where where how do you, what is the current situation of um, the guardrails versus the reality? Yeah, you know, I, I think that. You know, it's it's kind of moved away from the you know the masjid um, and sort of into the the living room. You know, uh, mm. and, and, and you know, so for example, you may have the the uh, imam of the masjid who um, uh, you know has to you know move away from even being a part of it. And now it's handed off to the the living room uh, imam, you know. Uh, so in in the in the living room, you don't have the same supports as the masjid. You know, it might be too much for the masjid uh, to handle. And and of, and of course, uh, right now, uh, even if you look at the West Coast, see, I'm speaking from a perspective in uh, South Los Angeles. Sure. It's gonna be a. It's gonna differ from the East Coast, mm. you know, uh, whether it's uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, especially Philly, and, and so on and so forth. Because there's the practice has become more institutionalized there. It's, it's more institutionalized. Exactly. You know, so, so the guardrails are kind of there just by virtue of the the longevity. Yeah. Of how yeah. long you've the had maturation. polygamous, polygynous yeah. relationships on the East Coast versus the West Coast. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah. it, you know, really considering, especially 
living in Los Angeles, I mean, you can't separate it from uh, the actual, you know, the cultural trends. You can't separate it from what's taking place in the economy. Mm, you know, so when yeah, you look at, is it a viable institution? You have to look at, well, um, the the rising prices of, of rent, um, unemployment rate, and so on and so forth. And also uh, what's taking place in regards to education in that, okay. in that area, you know. What about the cultural trends? I'm, 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 I want to dig into that one a bit. Cult, cultural trends in the wider community, yeah, not, yeah. Not so, the Muslim community? So, for example, if you have where, um, you know, hip-hop is very prominent, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you'll have certain things bleed into also, um, you know, uh, religious practices, you know. So, for example, you may have a, a culture that springs from hip-hop that promotes... Uh, so uh, the side chick, uh, yeah. uh, you know, um, phenomenon. The side chick, yeah, phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. model of the side chick, mm. and then it may influence what it means to accommodate uh, a second wife or you know a wife coming in, you know, um, and a person who's a product of the the side chick phenomenon uh, may uh, intertwine that model with the. Uh, what it means to be, you know, uh, you know, uh, to join a, you know, mm -hmm. plural family, to sure. become a part of a plural family. So sure. that's fascinating. Um, yeah. So you 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 have to take those things into uh, consideration. Yeah. You know, because nobody is existing just in 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 a vacuum. They're products of something. Right. You know, it's so, going to look different. Oakland, there's some, you know, the relationship formations and marriage formations in Oakland in the Bay Area. You know, and people from the Bay Area may know what I'm talking about. Um, is uh, it may uh, dictate a certain type of way that polygamy is being practiced, as opposed to South Los Angeles, as opposed to to Philly, as opposed to New York and New Jersey. Can we dig in? Can, can you, can you <laughs> know, tell us? Can you translate that? <laughs> You're, you've got like two Boy Scouts here who yeah. really know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated though. Polygamous marriages in in Oakland down the street. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm not. I'm, I'm really not... fascinated for this. That's it. A... I'm not saying that it it um, that that is the reality, but I'm I'm saying that. That, okay. That right. um, yeah. uh, it's possible. Right. It's possible that the the culture, the underlying culture, that a lot of times that may be influenced by uh, you know popular culture or hip hop or whether sure. whether movies or anything, it may you. okay. It, it tends to bleed yeah. into also right. marriage formation. You or, know, or how, anything really. Yeah. Like that's 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 yeah. actually. I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours yeah, about yeah. just the oh evolving. the influence. Yeah. Cult, how how like yeah. pop culture and culture non I'm not talking about religious culture I'm talking about no, no, mainstream culture mainstream. how it's evolving yeah. and the impact that's having on yeah. our community and how we practice yeah. or how we need to maybe just grow yeah and that's so or I just mean, informs conversations that are happening yeah, like yeah the exactly. tenure of the conversations the, the 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 types of issues that we were having to discuss that's right yeah. that wouldn't probably otherwise have just come about organically they're happening because of response to the zeitgeist that's yeah, right. yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah 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 and, and so the reality of it is is that yeah you know if you're a product of um, listening to hours and hours of, mm -hmm. of, of Snoop or <laughs> Too Short, you sure. know, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's going to also have bearings on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how you uh, approach, yeah. uh, you know, relationships with your, uh, with your spouse. So I, I made a generalization earlier, and I just wanted to ask, I kind of ask you what your thoughts were. I mean, I, I said, you know, it, the prevalence of this in the black community, mm -hmm. black Muslim community, let's mm -hmm. say. One, do you agree with that? Like, mm -hmm. is it much more common? I, I mean, again, like, right, is it much more common than you would see in the Indian Pakistani community? It's much more common than you would see in the Arab community, number one. But in the Arab it, American community. Yeah, Arab American. Sorry, I'm talking, speaking yeah. specifically within, yeah, the context yeah. of America or living in the West, let's yeah. say, right? Perhaps even in Europe. So, one, is it prevalent? Number two, if it is or if it's not, then, then, then how much of that, I guess, what was the general attitude about those type of practices either in the nation or you know imam martin muhammad himself so you're asking is there a historical line yeah, up to yeah, yeah. right 
Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not, you know, right out of, out of, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, was it a practice that was, has its root and roots and basis? Like you talked about the side chick phenomenon, but I mean, I'm, I'm seeking even, I'm, I'm saying even more on a respectable level or on a public level, like how much of that was sort of just things that were generally acceptable within the community? Yeah, so um, I'm less familiar with the the, the Nation of Islam, uh, sure. but from what I, uh, you know, the little information that I've been exposed to in regards to that's regarding the nation, um, I understand that there, there's uh, less acceptance for uh, poly polygynous relationships. Okay. Uh, Imam Wardi Muhammad, um, there were individuals that were around him. Um, that you know, I was very familiar with, um, who uh, you know did practice uh, polygyny. Um, so there, there, we've had models sure. of okay. um, you know polygynous relationships. Um, um, see, you know what happens is is that um, if there is no type of uh, orienting or uh, you know people being socialized to where it's a healthy practice. They then uh, grab on to um, those models that they have close proximity to, mm. and that's usually you know mm -hmm. those these hip hop models, you know, right? Uh, the you know, more corrosive, yeah, yeah, models, yeah, just mm. very toxic culture. That's right. Uh, um, that's right. So you know, so so for example, I, whether it's monogamy or uh, polygyny, there needs to be uh, an orientation. There needs to be some training. You know the the issue is we're getting into these these marriages um, without any uh, training, so we grab on to the the model that we have the closest proximity to, mm -hmm. and a lot of times these is we're borrowing from very destructive, like you said, corrosive uh, models. Mm, we wow. we've witnessed a lot of divorce in the uh, in the community, um, right? And I mean I've, I've proposed for the community like hey. Um, marriage, if this is going to be something that we look at as a viable institution for the future, the training has to start. I mean, we have a school. It, it, we we did, um, in our last summer program, we did an entire training um, for junior high school uh, children in regards to marriage. Yeah, yeah, and that that applies to whether you're talking about polygyny or monogamy or anything. Oh, for sure. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I, I got divorced after 17 years plus years and, yeah. and alhamdulillah just got remarried but uh yeah i mean congratulations you, yeah alhamdulillah thank you very much um just stuff you don't you learn you learn it's just like parenting you learn as yeah. you go right but that's yeah. really not the right the optimal way no, to do we things. Need to. right so imagine i mean you know even uh my african-american friends we all share this similar narrative you know uh we all been divorced you know and it's like it's almost like it's a uh it's uh, it's your rites of passage. It's a rite you know? of passage. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, um, yeah, you know, is is that healthy? You know, and I think what needs to happen is that whether a community, I, I'm not, a, I don't promote, uh, you know, polygyny, but the community that promotes uh, polygyny and or monogamy, whatever formation they promote, they need to provide. Um, and conduct classes and make sure they, they orient the people yeah. uh, towards being healthy, towards healthy models mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in those particular institutions. Can, can I ask you real quick, um, you mentioned toxic culture. Is there, are there, are there, are there subcultures that you can, like, that you can identify that are, you, you say are toxic? Are, there, are you talking to something specific, like certain things, trends you're saying? I'm very curious, and, and I'm, I'm talking as a parent of trying to kind of steer my kids in the right direction when it comes to the the different cultural impacts they're absorbing uh, or uh, taking in, right? Yeah. Is yeah. there? Are, I, I guess what I'm asking is, are there any? And then yeah. we'll come to the other question that I want to talk about with pop with culture. Um, is there anything specific you're seeing in terms of trends that you call that you would call the toxic culture? And kind of out of that, I have a follow up question as well. Yeah, you know, um, well, I mean, just to really, you know, the family. So one of the sayings is that religion is better caught, not taught. Um, so if you're catching, uh, you know, bad examples of religion, you know, whether it's uh, from 
uh, you know, uh, men who have uh, given you advice and they themselves have been unable to hold down a healthy family. You know, and this is a lot of times what we're getting as, as young people uh, coming up. I mean, uh, I'll never forget, um, you know, I found myself, uh, you know, surrounded by uh, elders who, who themselves didn't see, they caught perhaps bad religion, they caught bad examples. Mm. Um, so they never sat down and, uh, you know, received training on what it meant to be, uh, you know, a healthy husband or, you know, a healthy example of a model in the, of a man in the in the household, so they're giving us a, advice. I'm, I, and I've received some terrible uh, advice, but you know, I, I mean, you can't hold it against the person. I mean, they're they've been socialized in certain and uh, and brought up in certain in, environments, you know. So now we have to look at the proximity of uh, this toxic culture, whether it's reality television. Um, I've had to tell um, one gentleman. He says, "Well, polygamy is, you know." That's nothing to me. My grandfather was a, a, a pimp, you know. And I, I said, no, this is not. This is not pimping, you know. Yeah. It's this is a different model, um, and but this was he had this in close proximity. He was he was up close to pimping, you know. Um, and this is a different type of model. So now he's going to try to import that model. Yeah. To um, you know now dealing with with women. And those are the things that sometimes we can grab a hold of uh, that uh, impact us. What we, the music that we're listening to, what we're seeing on uh, on um, on television and everything else. Mm -hmm. it, our, our views of women, and I'm speak uh, specifically to mine. I know it's been impacted by um, you know some of the prominent hip hop artists. Um, which a lot of times they, they themselves couldn't even carry out what they were discussing in the music, but we became victimized, uh, you know, by you know the lyrics and everything else, and we tried to make it into real life when they, they themselves it wasn't even real life uh, for them. They were utilizing it as a means to support uh, their family, but uh, you know sometimes we ended up taking it as this is a, you know this is an actual class that they're giving mm -hmm. us on. You know how to be uh, husbands and how to be fathers. You know the. Um, I, I guess then are you now working while you're going to school and doing your masters, etc. Are you also now full time as an imam? Yeah, so okay. I'm, I'm full time as right. an imam and uh, going to school. Time. Got it. Got it. Going to school, uh, doing classes, but my classes aren't the same. You know, because I was very, like I said, you know, um, I remember I'm teaching, uh, you know, books. And when I'm sitting in the courses for the graduate school, uh -huh. it's now, it's 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 changing my relationship even with these classical books that I, I'm teaching. I see. You know, so, yeah. I, you know, I went through a period of time where, you know, I entered into sort of like a, you know, I'm almost... A, Almost a crisis of uh, I hear you. You know how I see the effectiveness of the material that I'm, I'm teaching. So, so on a high level, how did you reconcile that crisis? I mean, on a high level, I mean, yeah. I know it's probably a lot, but I imagine for the listeners who have to navigate, like what I like to call like the sort of standard Jama Khutbah version or Sunday school version of Islam that you've been taught, which yeah. there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. and it's practical, and you've made. Not you, but you know what I mean? Like people make great strides with just doing it that way for the rest of their lives. But then you come into contact, you go to the university or you, you know, you're introduced to now with online, right? The amount of information and whatnot out there can really like rock you and, and you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, at your core. So it's like being able to navigate, I think that is, is important. And so that's why I asked that question in that or a vantage point. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it takes time. You know, one thing, uh, you know, I, I begin to realize is that even, you know, because I went through a period where I'm like, okay, well, and maybe I'll turn the masjid into like a college classroom. Yeah. That didn't work either. They're like, man, what does that mean? You know, I, I remember I came into the community uh, one, one time and I started using this word paradigm. And they're like, man, what is that? You know, <laughs> what is, uh, you know, people, you know, they would nudge me like, 
what does that mean? They didn't want to ask in front of everybody. Sure, you sure, know, sure. Different words. Um, I hear you. Yeah. So, so I realized yeah. that even some of the, the information I was getting, you know, um, you know, with the people at the masjid, you don't want to complicate their world. You know, they're trying, especially in the inner city. Right. They're trying to. Um, they're dealing with their day to day of paying bills and right. and uh, you know making sure that they can keep their homes and so on and so forth. Um, but now I, I begin to really study how do I embed it in my leadership, mm. you know, um, without giving it over the membar. All the information that I'm getting is not to be disseminated over the membar, but I can embed it into, um, you know, so what I've been begin trying to figure out, okay, it's one thing to make something like a, a, a t-shirt slogan. You know, um, you know, love for your brother, which you love for yourself. But how do you embed that love as a mechanism without it being pronounced over a loudspeaker? Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, how do you, you know, uh, get people to love each other uh, without the khutbah? We we put so much on the message in the khutbah when uh, there's a lot of things that can take place. Um, without even being said, and there's a lot of change that can happen uh, without being uh, uh, listened to on a loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were talking about culture, right? I yeah. mean, people digest culture better than anything. Yeah, right. That's why that's why the toxic culture is influential. But maybe it's a lot easier to digest through uh, some form of non-toxic culture than it yeah. is to like learn the words like paradigm or, yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah. it is that that academic yeah. it's not for everybody right yeah. um i guess and i'm kind of my follow-up question to to the to, to the previous one about culture is you know i feel i heard a friend say the other day feels like there's a lot of more islam in culture now mm -hmm. in pop and i'm curious from from being in la and just from your perspective no, you I, think, I think you're talking about. I mean, in recent weeks, we've had yeah, you know yeah, yeah. an influx of some Converts sort of big names and, who are who have converted to the faith, exactly. uh, right? I mean, you know, beginning maybe a couple of years ago or a year ago now with Andrew Tate, but then more recently, you have uh, Sean King, you have uh, Little John, Little John, have, yeah, and then yeah. the list goes on. Uh -huh, and yeah, just in the MMA world, for example, there's right, like a that's whole, a whole like subculture, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, female I, I think, too. Yeah. Female. Yeah. MMA, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, fighters. Uh, right here in this mushroom, mm -hmm. actually, there was yeah, a yeah. MMA fighter, a woman who converted. Um, and I, and I think, you know, I was talking to my friend about this yesterday and he said, wow, it seems like we've kind of become the pop culture religion. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Are you seeing any of that being in kind of the epicenter of pop culture? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, so African, as an African American, I mean, we, there was a certain period in, especially in hip hop where your favorite uh, artist is going to mention a law. That's right. You know, I, I mean, like early nineties, right? Yeah, early nineties. I mean, you hear Bismillah. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be some Bismillah or Salam Alaikum. It, yeah. it, it, the pronunciation may not be to a certain standard, but you're hearing this yeah, yeah, yeah. in hip hop. That's right. We're running into certain figures in the uh, the masjid. I met uh, Yasin Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, formerly most deaf yes, at the masjid, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm, uh, uh Q-tip at the masjid. I'm, I'm running into, uh, these yeah. figures. There was a figure, uh, uh his name was, uh, Everlast. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Everlast performed at the masjid. He performed a song at one of our, uh, youth nights at the masjid. What it's like. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh. Amazing. Yeah. We, we had, uh, some Muslim actors where we went to, uh, live studio tapings um, because of um, there was there was a show called Rock the Rock. Oh yeah, and, um, great show. Uh, Daryl Savad, um, I believe he was on there, and then also he 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 was on um, um, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You know, so we had these figures. Yeah, and Lauren Hill, um, she mentioned Jins and Sirat al Mustaqim yeah. and all this, and and. I mean, as children, I mean, what that did to our confidence and our self-esteem oh, sure. as Muslim, I mean, that was powerful. Um, that was definitely powerful. But it, that was in the 90s. Then it kind of disappeared for a while. I feel like yeah. in the 2000s, even the 2010s, it disappeared. And, and I feel, anecdotally, mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of coming back. Yeah, I think it's coming back. But I I don't, you know, so I, I try to just stay positive in regards to what's taking place. There's something that's taking place, mm -hmm. and I, I try to stay positive. Um, you know, I think for the most part, you know, I, I, I'm at the bank, um, and this happened a couple of times, 
And then the lady who was uh, the bank, the banker, the teller, she said, she said, uh, I need to come to the mosque. I just finished listening to uh, Kevin Gates or something, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, as much as we may despise his presentation uh, of Islam or whatever, I, I mean, man, these people are reaching the people who are uh, taking their shahada now. They're reaching audiences that will never have access. Uh, too. So that's right. Allah knows best. I don't know exactly what's taking place. I try to stay optimistic yeah. on what's taking no, place you, with and the Muslims. Like Andrew Tate might be the most sort of well known, but I mean online celebrities, yeah. like people yeah. like influencers, mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. Loki and others. I mean, I don't even know this whole subculture mm -hmm. out there, but yeah. you know, the younger people do. I'm noticing yeah, yeah. something and it's maybe something yeah. just to keep an eye on, right? Yeah, for, yeah, sure. for right. sure. For sure. Let's talk before we wrap, let's talk about your PhD. Okay. What what yeah. was that? Well, I mean, we want to talk about the PhD. But that also it's oh, yeah, and it's like, yeah, yeah for sure. Okay, but yeah, I, I was about to I was thinking about the PhD as well. Well, okay. first of all, I guess what kind of prompts that? Because that's a that's a commitment. I mean, yeah. I don't know how long yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, so the the PhD, I think it's important in the uh, inner city. Um you have to have uh you know, definitely you have to have figures in the uh because you know, I, I looked at my uh upbringing. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very privileged. My father's an imam. Um, you know, I look at some of my friends who, um, you know, they kind of went, you know, wayward. They, you know, may have left the dean in regards to practice. You know, many of them still proclaim that they're Muslim. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've had some uh, dynamic figures, you know, from my father, like I mentioned, uh, Sheikh Jamal al-Din. Um, you know, also had uh, my my grandfather. Um, you know, uh, he was a doctor in Berkeley. You know, he's a PhD in Berkeley. You know, he was one of the early founders of the African American Museum in Oakland. This yeah. is your you know, mom's dad. Yeah, my mother, oh, mother's father. So yeah. your maternal grandfather. Yeah. Wow. So so you know, when I thought about my PhD, these are figures that I'm able to, uh, you know. Uh, construct a future self based off of these sure. models. Sure. You know, my father as an imam, my grandfather, Dr. Lawrence Couchet, you know, who is a prominent uh, historian, mm. you know, so, um, you know, so I realized that the importance of having models in, in, in these areas in the inner city. Right. The issue is, is that there's a lack of models so you can imagine a future self um, with these titles, you know, so I said, it's important for me to continue as, as much as the process was grueling and, and yeah. it took up a lot of time. Um, I said, I have to, uh, you know, stick with this. You know, my father, he was constantly, you know, you have to do it. You got to do it. You got to push forward. That's, um, yeah. You know, so I, I'm, I'm grateful on that. But I, I, um, the motivation, of course, was my experience as a Muslim and also um, as a, uh, an imam in the inner city. So in, in the inner city, I watched my friends in the Muslim community slowly get taken out by the inner city culture. You know, so one of my childhood friends, I mentioned he was uh, he was murdered. Another one of my childhood friends um, was also killed uh, and another was killed. Um, uh, I, I, I'll never forget receiving a letter from my childhood friend um, who he ended up getting caught up in the youth authority. You know, so he wrote me from uh, Juvenile Hall. He wrote uh, a letter. And this was when, you know, I'm, I'm maybe around sixth grade, um, you know, receiving letters from uh, my friends. Another one of my friends ended up in, uh, you know, Juvenile Hall. Mm -hmm. um, my friend, he just recently was released. Um, we went to uh, junior high school together. And then, um, you know, uh, I, I knew, um, I think, uh, junior high school and high school together. Um, we spent a little bit of high school together, and uh, he ended up in, uh, he did 25 years in, in prison, you know. Um, and so this right. is my example that I'm that I'm growing up seeing these things with Muslims in the community. At the Eid, I'll never forget, um, there's around a young, young black um, uh, Muslims, males around, we circled up. Just talking, it's like a reunion at the Eid. Uh -huh. Everyone, not myself, because you know I have a father in the house that would not, wouldn't let me get caught up in certain lifestyles. But 
they all were uh, representatives of gangs, the local gangs in the in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Wow. So yeah. imagine the Muslims, uh, young Muslim brothers now belonging to uh, local gangs. Yeah, the local gangs. You know, so out of that group, um, a couple of were of them were killed. Others ended up in prison and so on and so forth. So that prompted me to um, to to study uh, identity development. That's you what know. you did your PhD in. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. Not at Bayan. No, this was at Claremont School of Theology. Got so it. this was after uh, Islamic studies and uh, Islamic leadership program at Bayan. I graduated sure. yeah. from there with my masters, mm-hmm. and then went on to uh, Claremont School of Theology. Um, to and the degree they had, they offered in practical theology, it, uh, allowed me to also take uh, courses and um, and integrate theology along with social psychology. You know, so um, mm. you know, I studied you know cognitive development, also uh, social psychology along with theology. Uh, okay. Uh, and and the and the thesis is about like what makes you want to be a part of a group. Is that is that what? It's? Yeah, the thesis is 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 titled. Um, uh, raising of Moses, you know, and it's a play off of uh, also Musa alayhi salam in the uh, the the Quran. Um, he was Fir'aun wanted to uh, slaughter the young boys, you know, mm-hmm. and we look at this system really targeting the uh, you know the young African American males, right? Um, so um, it's it's a little play off of words, mm-hmm. and also um, uh, Cointel Pro. Um, yeah, and uh, this target of trying to prevent uh, a savior or a messiah from coming into uh, you know uh, the, the communities. Uh, so we said raising uh, a Moses, you know. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah, and yeah. then also uh, uh, one of my sons is named Moses, so mm. uh, raising a Moses, and it's. Um, is really breaking down destructive environments yeah. and allowing for the what we call the religious racial identity to flourish. You know, you can't separate. And this country is such so racialized that you can't so separate true. your Muslim identity from also uh, your race. So you have a religious racial identity, and how do you get that to flourish and to uh, reign prominent over other identities? You know, so yeah. um, I talked about you know what needs to be in the environment. Right. Um, you know, so that was. No, that's that, fascinating. That was, um, especially like I mean, you you, you mentioned COINTEL Pro and um, the dismantling of messianic discourse yeah. in the black community. Uh, th- that's a very interesting chapter of American history, one yeah. that definitely needs to be explored. But I, the fact that you sort of even pick like pick up on it and touch on that, I mean, I, I'm I'm just fascinated by. Yeah. Would love to get my hands on your yeah on, that's on, what on I was your thinking. on your dissertation. Oh, yeah, yeah. We could probably have another uh, yeah. another oh, podcast. Oh, have just you on that, come back that. and just discuss yeah, that? Yeah, that's you know? I think that's that's so important. As long as you give us some time to you know to do our homework um, yeah. and get it read. Uh, I'd love to engage you on that. Yes. It, it, it is it is yeah. Oster time in in the Bay Area in Ramadan, right. but we do want to hear about uh, yeah. your organization. Uh, okay, and, yeah. and then we'll we'll uh, let you go finally. <laughs> so, and 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 you're here representing mm-hmm. Isla, uh, being the executive director, founder, um, and trying to I, I think raise awareness and raise funds for the yeah. for, for the project. So definitely talk about that, and then we'll yeah. definitely get you to also mention where. Um, listeners who are listening and are interested in supporting the work, especially in this month of Ramadan, can do so. Yeah, so I think I, I mentioned before yeah. about the storefront masjid. Right. And the storefront masjid, it's a storefront facility, produces also almost like a storefront uh, mentality. mentality. Right. Um, you know, so it's Isla LA and Isla Academy represents our shift away from the storefront masjid model into a more robust community uh, center. Um, we found that uh, we outgrew the storefront masjid model in that it couldn't accommodate uh, the groups that we needed to serve. Uh, the youth, you know, now we have a, a room that we can deal specifically with our youth only. Right. And we have a, a room that we can specifically have our children, you know, in childcare nice. only. We have now... Uh, you know, um, uh, a bigger uh, masjid uh, facility where we have, without the threat of rodents uh, joining the, uh, the the line. So it represents that, that shift. Uh, it wasn't an easy shift because, you know, like anything else, you know, you're, 
you're um, now uh, trying on a new identity. You go from uh, storefront master goer to now you are a part of a community uh, center, and that comes along with uh, you know new form um, uh, politics, new form uh, um, and, you know uh, educational models, and so on and so forth. So right. um, we have Isla Lay and Isla Academy, which we founded in. 2013, we we began to move into our the new building that we purchased okay. uh, in around 2013, um, and now we have a food pantry that we serve uh, over 200 families on a weekly basis. Wow. Uh, we have. Um, uh, also, we have a school, full time school, Isla so the, Academy. Yeah, so Isla LA is the is, is the food is the uh, food kitchen and so yeah, Isla LA is the the center. Uh, yeah, social service masjid model. Got it. You know, um, I like that. Yeah, and then you have Isla Academy is the actual school. It's a private school, private school, K through eighth. Okay. You know, which we we. Are now trying to raise money to start our ninth and tenth grade. How many high kids school. are there right now? We have about seventy three children. You know, about seventy two, seventy three children uh, right now. Um, but yeah, so Isla Lay, we have the food pantry. We also have Isla Housing under Isla Lay. Is so that for formerly incarcerated? Yeah, formerly incarcerated. So we have uh, three campuses right now. Uh, one is is two houses um, that house. Formerly incarcerated men, also men who were threatened with homelessness. But it's mainly formerly incarcerated Muslim men in that housing. Yeah, I mean, if you add up the years that people have had, you know, are, are the leader of that housing has spent 27 years falsely accused uh, in, in prison, you know. Um, yeah. But uh, also the, the people in the housing, they have years, hundreds of years between them. Mm -hmm. um, and then also we have a, a campus for women. We have two houses for Formerly incarcerated, also women uh, threatened with homelessness, and our new our newest campus has three houses, and um, this is for refugees. You know, so we have mm -hmm. uh, refugees from Sudan, also from Gaza, uh, Afghanistan, and so on and so forth, right there in uh, in our new uh, housing, Islali. Now, when you say campuses, these are physical buildings in different parts of like S South LA. Yeah. Okay. Yes. A lot of what you're describing is 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 reminding me of like Iman and the work that at yeah, least parts similar. of okay okay yeah. so the the uh, the Isla LA part of it I mean the academy of course is like a private school that's yeah. separate but the Isla LA especially reminds me a lot of the work like Rami and and Iman is doing yeah yeah we look at you know they're, yeah. they're definitely a model mm -hmm. but also you know my my father Alhamdulillah I mean he had the M Foundation yeah no I didn't mean to imply yeah. that yeah because yeah. I mean I think LA itself has so many models yeah, I mean, yeah. including your yeah. own no, but father's Iman, sort of pastoral yeah. kind of model uh, but there was like the Uma the Uma Clinic in LA Uma Clinic these yeah. are one of our partners okay you have Iman we see them as one of our partners yeah. um, also uh, my father he founded the M Foundation and they have the uh, Humanitarian Day. So when you hear my father, I, I would say, you know, after 9-11, I mean, he's he's setting up, I think, the first model of those mass, um, you know, hygiene kits, you know, uh, passing out hygiene kits, also mass homeless feedings and everything else, you know. Mm. So he, he, he began doing that during the month of Ramadan um, in downtown Los Angeles. So this yeah. is we're on the shoulders of, I mean, they, these are giants with, right. that always made sure that Iman traveled into the neighborhood. It wasn't just uh, yeah. restricted to the, the storefront masjid, but you got to serve the... So, yeah. The so, I, I mean, I, I'm yeah, really interested in this idea of the move away from the storefront masjid to the model that you described as the social services yeah. masjid model. Yeah, that's 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 beautiful. Yeah, you know, well, so this move away from the storefront masjid model. Now, um, we have to figure out how to professionalize the storefront uh, from the and uh, move away from uh, almost um, uh, just uncouth uh, um, uh, organi organizations to a more professional organization in which we have accountants. Yeah. And now we have regular board meetings we have um, you know we make sure that there's uh, the finances there's transparency in regards to the finances you know I, I would always hear people uh, talk about transparency in the storefront masjid right 
And um, when I look back on it, you know, I always tell people, hey, we didn't have enough resources to even be transparent. We didn't know what it meant to be transparent. <laughs> right. You know, we had no idea what it meant to be transparent. So you, For sure. you're taxing us on something or you're uh, charging us with something we don't even know um, what it means to be transparent. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, but we, we learned that. So this is our move away from the storefront. Uh, Masjid is also uh, learning what financial transparency uh, means, what it means to do strategic planning, uh, so on and so forth. We had no idea about that. No, uh, I mean, I, and I think know. to be fair, I think that's true of a lot of organizations yeah. because, I mean, you're just starting out. And I, I think a lot of these issues, like whether it's guardrails, whether it's tra transparency, the needs for you know financial uh, transparency, et cetera, come as a result of abuses in the community. And yeah. so once the community sees abuses happen, then you, right, you, the, like the defenses and the alerts go up. And so the need to having transparency models becomes clear. So yeah, yeah. I don't think it's limited to, right, just growing pains that you encountered. Yeah. I, I would I would argue on a larger scale across, yeah. the, across the Muslim across community, the Muslim community. in America, yeah. you know, where you had abuses take place. I mean, leadership models that are toxic and, yeah. and abusive and what are best practices for nonprofits around, yeah. you know, built around individuals, et cetera, right? So yeah. um, anyway, um, yeah. I guess, so where can people go to find out more information and again, support the work that ISLA is doing. Yeah, islahla.org. Uh, so I-S-L-A-H-L-A -L -A -L -A, uh, dot org. Um, islahacademy.com uh, and dot org also. Um, we, we definitely need, we need um, uh, monthly donors. Uh, we need uh, also uh, large gifts from donors, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times, you know, in the inner city, the people who are, are the recipients of the service, these are our clients. Um, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult yeah. to collect money from the clients, Absolutely. you know. Absolutely. So we we come into yeah. I uh, was, suburban areas, you, yeah. know, to, you know. I think a lot of organizations struggle with that where I, I, I always used to say this when I was even when I, you know, I, I worked at Talif in their development department. Yeah. You know, what I used to like always raise is this idea where your beneficiaries are different yeah. than your benefactors. Yeah. So, you know, your beneficiaries, and in many cases, I would imagine, especially with the, given the work that what Isla, Isla LA is doing, your beneficiaries cannot become benefactors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you hope one day that they can. Yeah. And there's alumni and people who can, you know, but that's down the road. Right yeah. now, you know, you need benefactors who are willing to support you and believe in the work yeah. uh, just by virtue of what you're doing. Yeah, um, yeah, and so you know, other I think there's other organizations where you know you can create revenue generating streams within the services you provide. Yeah. That's difficult for an organization yeah, like yeah. Islaw Academy yeah. or Islaw LA. And then on the academy side, you've got to pay. You want to get you want to attract the best and the brightest. Yeah, yeah. Good educators, good teachers, having the facilities that you want. Yeah. Right, not a busted up gym. You yeah, know, yeah, like, right. Yeah, I mean, we we really, I mean. Right now, I mean, we have, for example, our principal, she's working on, uh, shout out to uh, Principal Aziza Ali. Uh, she's working on her, um, her, um, her doctorate in education. Um, we have, you know, our, uh, our teachers, I mean, they have the master's degrees, everything else. So sure. they're, they're, they're top when it comes to education. That's great. You know, I think that's, that's important. That and, is. Yeah. So, uh, for ourselves, we don't want to just, you know, uh, even we look at, we, we do trainings for other Muslim uh, schools, you know. So uh, we've been able to really sit down and, and study different educational models mm. to see what is a good fit for the uh, the modern Muslim self, you know, yeah. coming up. So, um, you know, yeah. we had uh, Habib Qadri from yeah. Chicago on okay. the show. Kind of reminds me of someone maybe that I should put you in touch with. Yeah, uh, I may. Yeah. I think okay. I may know him. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's All a right. lifetime educator. Yeah. Um, Superintendent you know. of the Chicago Muslim School. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I met him, I think, in, uh, in San Diego. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, and so uh, last question then, uh, what do you teach at, uh, at, Cla at uh, Bayan? Just curious. Okay. Um, so right now I have a course, like I'm in the middle of teaching a course on uh, uh, adolescent Muslim uh, identity development. 
you know so that's uh i think that's okay it. Yeah. we're definitely gonna uh, have, <laughs> have you back on the yeah, show yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. uh that's like my barbez knows our <laughs> listeners those are my, my topic of no no i think yeah. yeah and we'll make a trip down to la to make that happen yeah, no that's yeah, fascinating really. that's in which is kind of why i asked because i figured you were doing something interdisciplinary yeah, given your background yeah it's interdisciplinary yeah. I, it's you know just a, a quick little snippet you know sure. uh, you know you have the concept of identity salience you know, so this was real uh, prominent topic in my dissertation, um, and it says that you know you have multiple identities, and some are higher than others on this hierarchical scale. You know, um, and what dictates the height that the identity reaches is uh, the environment. You know, and so this is what I say. You know, there's there's certain things that you can place in the environment. To make sure that the uh, the identity um, is constantly being uh, called on, you know. So, just simple example is like, if I don't receive enough things to trigger and bring my identity to the conscious mind, okay, then it's going to fall to the bottom of the this hierarchical scale, and other identities that are triggered more are going to become more prominent. You know, you know, so, so for example, if, uh, if I'm getting, you know, just bring LA in this and I'm, if I'm getting, uh, a lot more what's cracking and what's popping more than assalamu alaikum, you're going to find one identity that's attached to that language, yeah. uh, reign prominent over the Muslim identity, you know, so it yeah. depends on what type of environment. Environmental you factors. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That yeah. kind of, uh, like you said, uh, trigger. Yeah, identities to rise. Yeah, fascinating. And that's called identity salience. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, okay. so it's, it's all on you know how salient the identity mm. is. Certain identities are more salient than others. Mm. You know. Yeah. Now, I mean, you know, going back to Omar's point, I mean, I'm trying to apply this to my teenagers. You know, so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Where can people? I guess uh, obviously they can find out about the work that Isla is doing, Isla Academy, as well as Isla LA. Yeah. Can people engage you directly? Can people find out more about you, follow you, whatever it may be? This is your chance to okay, kind of okay. <laughs> yeah, leave yes. the audience of, of somewhere where they can find more about you. Yeah, so I'm personally. I'm, I guess uh, Instagram. I mean, I'm on Instagram. I'm on. I'm on the gram. You know, that's the. Uh, for the I get. I don't know if that's. I I think Instagram is getting old too. You know. You it's, know. Uh, you're so right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but uh, jihad. Uh, Dot Sapphire, I believe, yeah. So um, it tells you how how just old we are, where we have to think about our like IG yeah, yeah, handle yeah, yeah. and you IG, it. yeah, that, yeah. That, that's yeah. Is that I what that? Guess, no, IG, because I think IG. you're right. I think for a while people were calling it the gram, and now yeah, is it yeah, IG? Yeah. I thought it was Insta for a while. Then it went. To it IG. was Insta. <laughs> that's right, Insta yeah, too in the middle. Yeah. It's too yeah. much to keep up yeah. with. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But and I think you're right. I mean, I think most. To, yeah. to, to Instagram as well. Really? Kids. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you yeah. know. So they can find you there. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I just want to just say that, you know, how important it is in regards to building up our institutions in the inner city. Yeah. Isla LA, like the other institutions in the inner city are important. They're essential. That we have to support Isla LA and Isla Academy. Uh, these are institutions. They are symbols in the, in the inner city. And it's like, for example, when a young person comes out and they see this huge master structure, like the one we're in, MCC or MCA, it symbolizes progress with them. They see the growth and everything else. If we see, if we're satisfied with seeing Islam in the inner city restricted to the storefront masjid, that becomes a symbol that Islam in the inner city doesn't mean progress. It doesn't mean growth, mm. right? Mm. And they, the children in the inner city are going to see other institutions grow and that begin to symbolize progress and growth and see the masjid as one that is not effective, is not socially effective, is not an effective model. So when they see us growing, uh, we just um, enhanced our religious space, right? We, we tripled the size of it. Because we have been in a smaller, we were uh, waiting on, um, you know, our ideas to kind of shape up and the funding for our bigger structure. But I'm like, in the meantime, there are years going past where you have a, uh, um, a generation, they're seeing the same thing, the same small space, 
with the same ran down carpet, right. it's going to become a symbol of uh, regression. You know, it's going to become. It's not going to become a symbol of progress. That's right. So we enhance the space with new carpet, new paint. Even though you know it's going to, it's going to hit the, it's going to tax the account. You know, but we, it, we have to make sure that we continue to symbolize progress and social effectiveness. Yeah. You know, in the. Uh, in you know, the, to hear you describe it that way, I think you. You know, I don't know if anybody's said this to you, but, and I say this in the highest, like, in the sense of the highest compliment, like, you've almost institutionalized yourself mm -hmm. in this organization. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, because as you were describing Isla or like, or the model of approach that you've mm -hmm. adopted, it reminded me of what you were saying when you were pursuing your PhD. Yeah. yeah. Like, you want models of excellence in the community you for people to. to aspire towards. Yeah. And, and you want to create those organizations and institutions in the inner city that are also models and symbols of what the community, yeah. like, represent progress in the community, yeah. not regression. Yeah. Or, biz, or stagnation. No, yeah. and that's, that's yeah. our nature as human beings. That's I mean, right. In the Quran, Allah gives us models. Mm -hmm. He gives us Fir'aun. He gives us Qarun, but he also gives us Musa alayhi salam and Yusuf and you know, so he gives us these these models that counter each other, um, and this is how the human being functions. The human being, when they come into the social environment, they look for effective models, and they look for non-effective models to imagine a, a place that they don't want to be, mm. but also to imagine a future a desirable future, to begin to form a desirable future. Our children in the inner city have to deal with the same thing. If Islam becomes in the domain that should that uh, should be reserved for other institutions, but it's in a domain in which they can't imagine an effective future in, you know, then they're going to adopt it as this is the avoidable model yeah. I'm, we're going to avoid becoming like this. Mm. And we have to make sure that Islam in the inner city also, as we're watching it flourish all around the, the country in the more affluent areas. But what about the inner city? They also need, uh, because our imagination is possible, powerful in regards to how we shape our future identities. You know, So when our children come in and they see a... a a burgeoning community, a community that's growing and, and progressing, they're going to also want to model that for their future, and they're going to want to want their children to experience that. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. I think it's a great place to end. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's tough in Ramadan, but you took the time, and you're traveling on top of it. So my co my cognition or my <laughs> cognitive ability has been. I think listeners have to excuse all three yeah, of yeah, us. We're, I mean, we're all we're all yeah. That's right. We're all <laughs> we are fasting. My brain is slow right now. I mean, it's like man, I, I'm. I'm not able to grab the words that I want. Right. You know, yeah, no, no, no. If our listeners are listening to this after Eid, <laughs> exactly. Just, re yeah, yeah, just yeah, remember yeah. back a cup, you know, when you were fasting <laughs> as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, but yeah, no, really enjoyed yeah. the conversation. My my course is on oh, for Bayan. Yeah, that's right. Okay, you so didn't Muslim finish. adolescent identity right. development, also uh, uh, conflict resolution and peace building, um, and then I teach a class on uh, anti racism and also. Um, anti-racist uh, uh, pedagogy and and also uh, race and education and Got it. so on and so mm. forth. Yeah. No, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I was just saying, listeners, uh, if you want to reach out with questions, comments, you can always hit us up by emailing us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. As always, if you support the show, please go to Patreon, become a patron of the show. We can always use the help. And uh, yeah, thank you as always for listening and have a blessed Ramadan. We may have one more episode that we drop in the month of Ramadan, but if not, we'll definitely see you soon on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. <laughs> Oh, my God.